in the dark days of the COVID lockdowns, St Anthony, Lackymore, Robert and myself sat down to record the Nine in a Row Chronicles. They were a fan's perspective and a fan's recollection of a unique time in Celtic's history. For St Anthony and I, the recollections were only just there for the end of the Nine in a Row series, but for Robert and Lackymore, they were much more prevalent. One of the things the series did do was bring into focus how some football supporters can be very focused on their team, but maybe have lesser memories of other matters. So when, in trying to give the context and wider social history of what was going on at the time, I asked Lackey Moore as we went into the 69-70 season of his memories of the moon landings. He couldn't quite remember but he what he was doing at that time, but he had a clear and focused memory on what was happening for the rest of that season in the Celtic games. When we recorded the Nine in a Row Chronicles, we always knew that there was another series to follow, but at the time, we didn't know whether it would be the 9, 10, 11 or more. Of course, it ended up being the second Nine in a Row Chronicles that we would be recording and an incredible time in Celtic's history. And this is the first episode. It is free to all and will be out every Sunday morning thereafter. However, subsequent episodes will be available only to paid subscribers. So if you want to listen to the rest of the Nine in a Row Chronicles, then you need to subscribe. You need to log on to the celticunderground.substack.com and take out a subscription to listen to the Nine in a Row Chronicles. And obviously, it's fresher in the minds, but it's amazing the things you've forgotten. So this particular series will feature St Anthony, Robert, myself. Unfortunately, Lackey Moore was on his boat when we recorded it. So Andrew Smith gives us the perspective at times, the perspective in the press box of what was going on with such incredible things, such as our nearest rivals going bust. And no uh, main competitor in the top leagues. And then, of course, an incredible run that included an invincible season and four trebles. As I say, log on to thiscelticunderground.substack.com to be able to listen to these fantastic recollections of the recent nine in a row and yes we will cover why we didn't make it 10 log on pick these up every sunday Okay, so this is the first season of the second nine in a row um, chronicles that we did the first one during COVID, actually. Robert uh, Saint, myself and um, and Lackey Moore, who's currently on a boat somewhere, uh, apparently, <laughs> if there's nice weather, he goes sailing. So he's he's somewhere on, on Dignity, uh, sailing around the west of Scotland uh, with his lunch in a sun-blessed bag. Anyway... Uh, so it's season uh, 2011-12, so to set the, the context of that, um, season 2011-12, Top Watch TV programmes were uh, the final of X Factor, which was won by Little Mix, I'm sure everybody on here was glued to that, and there was also some people from Hello Magazine had a wedding, there was a royal wedding on, uh, so uh, that was also, that was joint with X Factor for Top Watch programme, Top Film, uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, apparently uh, Transformers, Pirates of the Caribbean Something from the Twilight Saga Again, everybody on here would have been glued to their films uh, The n number one on the day of the opening game of the, the league season Was And and, and t t to do the old-fashioned uh, pop pickers Ten points for anybody who gets this one Who can sing this one It was The Wanted with Glad You Came Anybody? Mm. Anybody? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. nope. uh, so uh, in the news uh, at that time as well, it was the uh, in your world uh, at the time, Andrew. It was the last ever edition of the News of the World. No, oh, uh, yeah, the weekend well, before the season kicked off. A few of my friends lost their jobs there. Yeah, yeah. 
And and through the the course of the season, we lost a a, a few people. Um, Amy Winehouse, she passed away on the opening weekend of the season. Uh, Joe Frazier died in the November. Uh, Whitney Houston, uh, she died on the same weekend that Rangers Football Club uh, went by the wayside. Um, Steve Jobs, Colonel Gaddafi, Robin Gibb, Gibb and Davy Jones, those were people that we lost during the... During the season, so that's setting setting the scene. Um, what were you guys up to in your life, Andrew? Where were where were you at the time? Season twenty eleven twelve. I was working in uh, the Midlands Scottish football for Scotsman Stroke Scotland and Sunday, and we'll come on to it. But Scotland and Sunday, we used to have our weekly calls with a company called Duff and Phelps, which was always quite entertaining about what they were saying of any given week. <laughs> it was some fun stuff, I must say. It was one of the most enjoyable seasons I had. Nothing to do with Celtic, actually. <laughs> but um, but Robert, what were you up to in your life around that time? Anything momentous in your life around that time? Season 2011 12? I was, I was living in, in just moved from Hong Kong, where I'd been for about 20 years, to Singapore. So. Uh, it was a new job, new city. But, you know, by that stage, I mean, I was looking at the fixtures. I've certainly had a lot of games at the start of the season. I uh, must have been back for the summer. But uh, at that stage, the you know, Celtic TV coverage was becoming much, much more reliable. Um, uh, I would have seen virtually every game that season, even the ones in the middle of the night. So, Half past three or whatever. Yeah. Seen anything special going on in your life at the time? Um, probably the most special thing was my son was, was seven and taking a real act, a real active interest in football. And, uh, everything at that age just seemed to revolve about either playing football or watching football, going to see Celtic, and uh, writing articles for this Earthswell website as well. Six months at the time. So, in terms of football, we were going into this season on quite a, a downer. Um, mm-hmm. Rangers were going for four in a row. Uh, we we Strachan, we'd lost the league under Strachan in his last season. We had the um, the debacle of the the Mowbray season, um, and then um, we'd lost the league in, in Neil Lennon's first season. So, we were going into that league under under mm-hmm. real pressure. Um, and so the the start of it continued that um, weird, odd. It was a, it was a it was an odd start to the season. Um, the the first week weekend of the season was twenty third, twenty fourth of of July. So it was a really early start to the season, and our pre season preparation sort of straddled the start of the season. We played pre season games before the season kicked off, and then pre season games after the season had kicked off. Uh, where we played in a tournament in in Ireland and uh, uh, it didn't go particularly well. Do you have any memories, Andrew, of the of the pre season? Well, I see when you mentioned that in Ireland, I think I was at that. Was that they played AC Milan, and it became a real kind of Inter, Inter Milan. And, oh, was it Inter? Sorry, Inter. Sorry, they played Inter, oh. and uh, it became a right Barney. It was a really ill tempered game. Oh. That's my memory of it. But my memory of it when I was looking back there. They were saying Mo Bangura, and I know that mm-hmm. it's not a name that lives long, but I always remember the story was that there was two Banguras playing in, in Sweden, and uh, <laughs> they didn't mean to sign Mo Bangura. That was whether it was true or no. So the, the rumour went around <laughs> that Swedish journalists were telling journalists, yeah, you've signed the bad Bangura, as opposed to the good. There was a good Bangura and a bad Bangura, and you've signed the bad Bangura. And that was like so, but they did sign Adam Matthews and Kelvin Wilson. But who, but who remembers? My son actually asked me about this guy the other day, Badir El Kaduri. Okay. He was only yeah, signed so... though because as a Gary get injured, I think if it was that, no, a bit of a, an emergency. Uh, yeah. Sign. On yeah. 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 Yeah.
like the South Australia Jones games. Yeah. yeah, not in from down yet. The one yeah. thing interesting, Harry, about the, the pre season games was I'm sure we played Swansea and Brendan Rodgers was the manager. Would that be right? Yeah, we did. Um... It's the first time I've ever heard of Brendan Rodgers at that time because Swansea were doing really well. And um, apparently they played us off the park that night. So he was beginning to make a name. Yeah, we lost 2 now uh, at, at, at Swansea. So, yeah, it was not an auspicious start uh, to the league campaign. And uh, the weirdness, uh, we, obviously Neil Lennon hadn't done so well the previous season in Europe. And then we start off, um, and we'll start with the Europa League uh, qualifying uh, Saint. And we had the weirdest set, set of situations when we played C on and we got beat, but went through. We went through 3 0 <laughs> on aggregate, even yeah. though we got beat. Now that we drew 0 0 at Celtic Park and get beat 3 1 away. So, to the younger listeners, not that there are that many on our podcast, to the younger listeners or the people who have forgotten, say, do you want to start? And obviously, we'll go around. Do you want to start with trying to give an explanation as to how we managed to go through 3 0 having lost 3 1? Well, well, first of all, see on. Um... We were big favourites against Sion, and I remember seeing them at Celtic Park, and they were a better team than we were led to believe that they were. So the nothing each draw at Parkhead, away goals, still counted for something back then. Even alone for that, there wasn't much chance. But <clears throat> the strange thing was, and Andrew will be able to allude to this more than me, um, when we were well beaten on the night, but even before the game, that my recollection is that the CEO and chairman says that there was two players, but there was one with connection to Dundee United, I can't remember his name. Um, and he said, I'm playing these two guys. And, and the newspapers picked up and they said, he can't play them because they're ineligible to play for whatever reason. And, and I remember that the days afterwards um, where, where there was a big um, furore about that these two guys shouldn't have played. And it became clear that um, Celtic had a case and it went to UEFA, but as everything with UEFA, it took quite a while to, to, come to, to come to a decision. Another thing about UEFA as well is, from a Celtic perspective, um, they've never been kind to us. You know, you think Atletico Madrid in 74, Rapid Vienna in 1984, a lot of us didn't have any faith in UEFA. But I remember it was a Friday and the news came through that Sion had been put out and we were put, we, we qualified into the group stages. But I think because Sion had a lower um, coefficient than we had, we went into pot four, whereas if we'd qualified off our own back, we'd have went into pot two. So to, to cut a long story short, Sion get kicked out and we get put in a group, a harder group than we really should have been put in. Yeah. yeah. Andrew, I mean, you would have been reporting was, on this, so... I did. I was out in Sion that night. What a beautiful place that was. Stunning place. Celtic were murder that night in Mostorovic particularly. My memory is he had a shocker. But I remember that whole uh, tie all around about that tie because I'd read into it about their mad chairman, uh, Christian Constantine. He's still in charge. I think he's had 50 managers. One season he had 11 managers and he actually sacked a manager for smelling. Look, uh, this guy was a crazy guy, right? Look, uh, but he had, they, they were under a, a transfer um, embargo. They weren't allowed to make transfers. And he said, stuff that. So he signed five players, and he says, I'm playing these guys. So, But his own uh, uh, FA said, you can't play these guys, you can't register these guys. Like, uh, they took it to the Swiss courts, they said, no, your, your FA is right, you can't uh, uh, play these guys. He took it, it, it went to Cass, I read the full Cass judgment, and so I knew it didn't matter what happened on the pitch. So we were sitting in Sion and everybody's saying after it, it's like, oh, I said to my, I remember turning to my colleague, Paul Forsyth, I said, I don't know how to write this because Celtic are out, but they're no out. Because there's no way on earth the Celtic aren't going through. But nobody would build, it was people, it's like Stephen says, people think, ah, you can say that, but will they really make that decision? Yeah, but it was so cut and dried. It was so clear cut. It wasn't like the Legia Warsaw one like a couple of seasons later. It was so incredibly clear cut. And this guy was just a complete maverick. He thought, I'll cock a snook to every one of the governing bodies. So it was Celtic were always going to go through because he just played players he had no right to register and had no right to play. 
you, you, how were you feeling, Robert? Because I remember looking at it thinking, this guy's crazy. doesn't matter what... I remember, same as you, Andrew, I thought, everything I've read, this is so black and white. We're through. He, he's an idiot, because we're through. Because I don't yeah. even know why his manager's not saying, no, I'm refusing to do this. He's playing players that we know make us through. So what is the point? Uh, Robert, were you Matt, as confident as Andrew and I? Um, yeah, I I just followed. I was probably reading what Andrew was writing. I think that it was important, really, really important for us in the light season. It gets to a beyond because when Lennon, Lennon got a job full time, so earlier, he basically bought a new team. So Ledley, Stokes, McGrew, a whole bunch of them, Berham, Kyle, etc. Um, these guys didn't have any experience in Europe at all. And as Stephen says, we got very tough to draw after CEO and were kicked out. And, you know, it's pretty bad luck if you get drawn against a French team, an Italian team, and a Spanish team in, in the same sort of league. But I had to think it proved to be beneficial. I don't think I had much expectation, um, but I think we had put ourselves pretty well across the first stages, and um, more importantly, it's just great experience for the players, and we got the benefit. Talk about it next time. So it's, it's, we then we then go into the group stages, and as you point out, Stephen, um, we go into a group that we weren't really supposed to be in because the, all of this legal shenanigans and, and appeals were were going on while UEFA were moving forward with the the group. So. One of the other aspects of now that they've changed it slightly, but when they they'd not long for the Europa League process brought out the six o'clock kickoff, mm-hmm. and and initially they gave assurances to the northern or to the teams in our time zone, basically us in Portuguese teams, that we wouldn't get six p.m. home games when they first brought it out. They gave that assurance, and but of course we had six p.m. times because we were playing as Sions thing. So one of the things that struck me when I looked back was how low the attendances were for the group yeah. stages of this. Uh, Celtic Udinese, which I think was the first 6pm kickoff one, which of course if, if people, even even if you live and work in Glasgow and you finish work at 5 o'clock, you're struggling to get into a game at 6 o'clock at night. And there was 37,000 people at that uh, Udinese uh, game. So as Robert says, uh, Stephen, we actually acquitted ourselves reasonably well in that competition. We lost 2-0 away to Atletico Madrid. We drew 1-1 at home to Udinese and it was an 88th minute penalty for, from, from them. We um, we drew 1-1 away to Rennes. It was an excellent performance with the exception of Chadery putting the ball in the back of the net. It was just one of those catastrophic, I can't believe... He's done that, things that Celtic do in Europe. We beat Ren 3-1 at home. We lose to Atletico Madrid, 1-0 at home. And then we draw one each uh, away to Udinese. So the results were actually OK. Again, less than 30... Maybe maybe the Ren game was at 6 o'clock. There was less than 30,000 nope. people at the Ren. The Ren wasn't. I think maybe you're, like um, people don't maybe tend to remember. That was the standard kind of attendance for Europa League. Supporters thought it was really down market to be in the Europa League. Celtic supporters, especially at that time, that they, they, they between thirty and forty thousand was not unusual for Europa League games for Celtic. If you were right, outside we, we, the we, we, League, we bought into the, the rest of Europe. Didn't we bought into that English media narrative that the Europa League was a diddy competition? The rest of Europe yeah. didn't think like that, but 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 the English did. So we bought in. We bought into that. Yeah, yeah. Robert, it was. Robert. Sorry, Steen. Sorry, Andrew, I interrupt you. Oh, no, no, you go, Steen. No, I was just going to say that I thought Robert made a really good point there about that team gaining experience for the following, league, uh, following year in the, in the Champions League because um, we, we, not just that as well, but Neil Lennon himself 
but still very inexperienced in terms of being a European manager. And and I think for all his faults, that there, there, there was some really good results that season, good performances. Yep. And um, it, 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 it showed us that I think we were on the right trajectory in terms of the team improving. Yeah. And especially away from home, it was so, it was almost just expected. Didn't matter who Celtic played away from home. But even if you think about it, even when they were getting to the last 16, you know, they were still losing heavily to Copenhagen, you know, and then they lost away to Allberg. They couldn't beat anybody. So he went to Italy, you know, where Celtic traditionally lost, you know, and he got his draw, went to Rennes, should have won that night. You know, again, it's like a kind of big five league teams going away from home and actually been able to quit yourself, you know, not just be patsies, which was quite unusual for a Celtic team in Europe round about that time. And as Robert yeah, says, so Ro- said, that, that showed you a certain resilience. Yeah. We can't some great results in Europe, you know, under the nail and on this track. And just from the, the end of this track, you know, we saw evidence of a decline in Europe, and then we have the catastrophic World Cup season. Um, you know, so these were the some some signs I think of improvement from this from this campaign. You know, which you know we forget how successful we were in Europe. We could be pinches. Something that's been really lacking in the last. So we we um, we had a European campaign. It was um, it was a bit like a feel we've had for many years, which is we're always making excuses for. It was actually quite good relative to the season before, and 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 during it, you're thinking so. This is an opportunity to build for the future. So I think every second European campaign eh, for about the last twenty years has felt a bit like that. So, eh, but eh, so we had that, and then obviously we'll get into the to the league season. So the league season kicked off really, really early. Um, Stephen, it kicked off on the twenty fourth of July. Um, it was to do with the uh, Euros coming up in in twenty twelve. Um, so we started off eh, not bad. Uh, first three games away to Hibs we won 2-0 away to Aberdeen we won 1-0 home to Dundee United we won 5-1 um, then we drew uh, sorry we lost at home to St Johnston 1-0 and then won away to St Mirren uh, 2-0 so three out of the first five games through August were um, we're, we're away from home um, and we, we, we lost the one game but it was actually at Celtic Park so uh, Stephen uh, do you want to sort of talk through how you are feeling in the in the in the start of the season in the August? The main recollection I've got of that period is that Hooper and Stokes were beginning to uh, have a, a cracking partnership, and um, that gave us a, a lot of hope. Um, on the downside, the, the defence has always been an issue, and I was never convinced by Kelvin Wilson or, or Mastorovic or some of the other guys that were playing at, the, at that time, Glenn Leuven. So, the, you know, you had the good and the bad. Going forward, we were excellent, scoring a lot of goals, creating a lot of chances. But, you know, the, the old soft underbelly of many a Celtic team has been the centre, centre of the, the defensive area. And I, I just remember having grave concerns at that time that as much as we were scoring goals, we were, we were still pretty vulnerable. And the St. Johnson game was a Sunday. It was a horrible game. It was, I'm trying to think, it might have been run about the time of the sea on um, qualifiers. And, and it was just one of those games that, that as Andrew was saying, there wasn't a great atmosphere at that time, maybe it had been about 40,000. 40, um, and the fans were just dead frustrated. Uh, and it was a Sunday, there wasn't any atmosphere. It was, it was just a horrible, horrible afternoon. And, and that, that gave me concern at the time that Lennon had the exactly... Um, overcame his problems from the previous season. But I was still relatively optimistic at that thing. Robert, what were your, your thoughts? Yeah, I remember being at that St. Johnson game with our kids and we missed a penalty very early on. I think Chris Collins missed. I think, I might be wrong, I think he was left on one now as 
debut for Celtic. He was playing with the centre back rather than midfield that he grew into. Um, it was a smash and grab on St Johnson, but we did not we did not play well. Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a blow because Rangers had off to a decent start uh, in the early part of the season. So there was already you know, they were already a bit ahead of us after four or five games. So, 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 so the 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 because we'd gone into the season um with Rangers having won the last three titles, getting back to your point, Stephen, um there was a sense the, the the fans were 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 in an in a place where they'd be quick to criticise. Um so a one 0 defeat at home to St Johnson's not going to help. We then go into September, and uh, we always have that. It always frustrates me that the end of the transfer window, um, and we sign players right at the end of the transfer window, and then you have the international break, so you actually sign people and then can't see them for two weeks. Always, always really frustrates me. Um, so September has fewer games in it. We beat Motherwell four 0 at home, and we beat Inverness two 0 at home. But Sammy's in between them was a defeat to Rangers. Um, you definitely would have been at Ibrox, Andrew. Uh, Celtic lost 4-2. Do you remember much about that game? I, I do, I do. Actually, I was at Ibrox, um, but my friend, it was the, that's the last time I was ever in the Broom Lone stand. Because I was working, I, my, my days were kind of Tuesday to Saturday, so the game was on a Sunday, I remember. And he said, look, I've got a spare ticket. I said, I haven't been in here for... 50, I haven't been in there for 15 years I couldn't even remember the last time I was in there I, I, like because I worked like uh, for all those years, subsequent years so he said why don't you come for old time's sake just come to the Broomlone stand and sit among the punters so I remember going down and I thought can't be bothered taking my car or anything so I'll go in the tube and I went in the tube and my timekeeping's not the greatest so I went in the tube and I got there about 5 minutes before kick off and what I'll never forget is the tube was empty. It was completely empty. And it was weird walking for the tube because normally I would go to the tube when I was covering games, but I'd go to the tube and then I'd just walk into the, the main stand. But I was actually going to the tube and walking. I thought I was going to walk through all these Rangers sports to get to all these Celtic sports. I hardly saw a soul. I don't know what it was. Hardly saw a soul. And all the way around to, to go to the Broomlone stand and meet him just a couple of minutes before kickoff. And I remember... Um, Naismith was, Naismith had a habit of turning up for these games, and it was four two. Oh. Remember rightly, didn't it? And he scored twice. Didn't he? Yeah. Is that right? Am I getting that one right? Yeah, he scored twice. The second goal and was the fourth in 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 Very time. much, Rangers very much deserved it. Celtic were okay in the first half, but they just capitulated in the second half. Is my memory. They they were really, as Stephen said, that the, the the flakiness in defence, just that haunted them at that period. Because if you think about it, I mean, like people forget it was McCoy. Rangers were under new management, Ali McCoy. Rangers' first ten league games, because I remember I, I, I was at a lot of them. I was at a lot of them. Like uh, he, he drew one and one nine. That was his. That was his high point as a football manager. Was that first two months of the 2011-12 season? Meanwhile, all the while. Craig White wasn't he paying any, wasn't he paying any tax on top of the tax that hadn't been paid before? So it was all, you know what I mean. The car crash was, you know, we were just watching it in slow motion. That was why I think a lot of supporters, because they would have wanted Lennon's head in a stick, but everybody thought, ah, well, you know, it's coming, it's coming. The snowball is rolling down the hill, you know what I mean. And Rangers have just got to get buried under it. It's like that. It's uh, so Labour the tax bombshell, you know, it was like almost we had this <laughs> in a with this with Rangers in it, you know, and it was just Rangers in the and we were just waiting for it. So, so Robert, and I'll get onto a story about the waiting for it thing. So, Robert, uh, do you remember much? Because we we were two one up in that game at half time. We were, uh, yeah. and and we mentioned El Caduri. So, to, you know, tell us about it. You get, uh, I guess what used to be called a daisy card. The yards out, and it was a feeble effort. And I think McGregor actually went down on it on one knee just to collect it, and it went through his legs. I think it was right before half time. 
first two one. But it scored an excellent player to be quite. But um second half just didn't turn up. I I remember they were hitting a lot of balls to the back post for Lafferty. He was up against Al Kaduri, he was up the same, you know, diminutive uh, stature as Ezegiri, who he'd replaced in the team. So the, the, the Rangers tactic was to use Lafferty's height against their left back. And I think it was Sandridge who said the second half. I do remember vividly Charlie Mungo getting sent off. I don't know if it was a straight red or two yellows, but he, he wiped somebody out. I could be nice, I thought Davis and sent off. And, and Lennon, Lennon complained. Heavily about the red card decision, but it, it looked like a shocker, is what's in my memory. But, I mean, that was a tough defeat, having lost to St. Johnson. You know, Rangers, as Andrew said, off to a terrific start, just one slip up at the first game of the season against us. So they were already six, seven, eight points ahead of us. Um, yeah, and, and a difficult period for them, um, where you know, there was no margin for that. And, and Rangers were relying so much on Champions League money and mm. it was everything to, to, to get automatic qualification. And they, I think Rangers were cheating for that. That's an interesting point about the Champions League there, but um, Harry, because. I remember sitting in my car in Paisley of all places. I remember us vividly listening to Radio Scotland. And uh, I can't even remember that it was Rangers and Malmo, right? So, and, and it was really tight. I think Malmo were winning in away goals. And in the last seconds of the game, Jelovic broke through and he, he'd, he'd won one with the keeper. And I'm sitting in the car thinking, oh no, he's going to score this. They're going to go through. And, and it's, it's just, just when Robert said there how they were reliant on the Champions League money. And he missed the chance. And almost immediately the final whistle went. And the feeling of relief in the car, for me, you know, just sitting myself in, in this. I, I think my son was playing football that night. And, and I, I just went to the car to listen to the radio. And um, it just, uh, uh, there, there was almost, sometimes you get a premonition. And I remember thinking at the time, that's it. You know, without the Champions League money, they're done for. Um, because the, the off, off the pitch headlines were, were taking precedence to the on the pitch headlines at that time and um, you know that Lou, Lou is, uh, I mean McC McCoy's for example I think he, he lost to um, Malmo and then Andrew I can't remember who did he lose to Ma Maribor uh, Maribor Mar Mar there you go yeah. so he, he lost two qualifiers and, and I think yeah. Craig White alluded to that a, a later on in the season that if he had get some money coming in at that time whether it was Champions League or Europa League yep. they might have been able to keep the doors open so that that's a really important thing to highlight the Malmo defeat was catastrophic yeah he hated him White blamed him <laughs> he blamed mm -hmm. him for he, remember if, you, if you've seen his book and all that this, the guy was never a football manager because he was as you say he was banking on some kind of European money income mm -hmm. yeah 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 I mean I think uh, it was interesting that in the next couple of seasons both came with Parkhead. Um, mm. Yeah. Stuff does get Peter. good as well. Mm. But they, I did read Craig White's book when it came out um, three or four <laughs> years ago. And there's one, I mean, half of the book is a crap. But there's like two or three chapters which are essential reading. But one of them is after the Marlboro and Marlboro games, they steadfastly at that point stopped paying PAY. Yeah, HMRC. They just mm. they the only cash flow that they could effectively save and generate was for paying PY, not paying VAT, not paying national insurance contributions, and and it was certainly triggered by those two European defeats, or, or became more extreme as a result of those two mm. European defeats. So I know we're supposed to be talking about Europe, but we just we just got to keep on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, yeah, it didn't exist, so, and, you know, the two clubs, so they, they've never been so entwined in terms of what happened to both of them than that season. Mm -hmm. That was a season that just, you know, that was everything in sense. Well, well it is, and, and, and you mentioned that the, the two sort of rookie managers, uh, Andrew, and, and, and my tale, this is 
what I always sort of tell when, if you speak to Rangers fans about you let your club die and they say, well, well, what else could we have done? And, well, you could have been ready to deal with it when the problem came, but how did we know it was going to happen? Well, I always use the tale of... Uh, Used to go to to uh, used to go down to the cricket in the summer. Me and my brother and a couple of mates, we'd go to a one a one day international or something somewhere in one you know, during the, the summer months. And I can still I could take you to the street in Manchester, where myself, my brother, and one of our <laughs> mates who's a Rangers fan, we're, we're walking away from the game, we're walking back to the car, and the Rangers fan mate says, uh, "You guys had a bad season." Under Lennon, he's a club legend. We've now got McCoy in charge. Um, and I think back to how long we allowed John Gregg to go because he was a club legend. We we allowed him to, to manage the team in much dire, more dire straits than I think modern football fans would allow. Do you think, uh, we both got it, do, do, do you think the fans would turn on these legends quicker than, than we turned on John Gregg Back back in the in the eighties, I mean, do you think do you think if the if you're not in the, if if it's clear that you're not going to win the league by Christmas that you your fans will just turn on Lennon and he'll be fired, he'll go. And I remember like both at exactly the same time, my brother and I both turned and said, "Well, it won't matter because you guys are going bust this season." It was just so we just all knew it was going to happen and so this defence yep. that Rangers fans have of we didn't know and what could we, well we knew I mean it was it was it was it was such a the thing about it is I was going about that the way that my brother and I said it it was so matter of fact that it was just everybody knew it was going to happen I mean our website had had mentioned EBTs like two years earlier everybody knew it yeah. was going to happen but but we got, we all got it wrong. Let's let's be honest here. We all got it wrong, because if you remember, the first tier tribunal about EBTs was supposed to make its judgment that October. Now that's another reason why Craig White wasn't paying anything, because he said, "I'm throwing good money after bad. I'm throwing it into a pit here." Because what will happen is I want to do the switcheroo. Once once the the first tier tribunal finds against. Like uh, Rangers for their use of EBTs or misuse, as I used to write. Misuse, it was if you used them properly, you might have got away with it, but it was misuse of EBTs. Like, uh, so it was supposed to find in October, and then when it came to the October, it was delayed, if you remember. It was delayed. It wasn't actually for another two, like, uh, it, was another, it wasn't another year until they actually, and, and when the first judgment came, the judgment found in favour of Rangers, if you remember rightly. So, he miscalculated, quite miscalculated. He thought, I'm not paying all this money because it's just going to be money I'm throwing down a well. So what I'll wait is, I'll wait till that judgment comes in October, and he saw it as well. He saw there was a misuse of EBTs, and he said, right, I'll, I'll put the club in administration, do the switcheroo, new company and all that kind of stuff, and then we'll, we'll go again, and it'll be the, this, this slate is wiped clean. Even though I've paid... New 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 contracts to the likes of Stephen Naismith and twenty six grand a week, like uh, uh, Stephen Whitaker twenty four grand a week. He paid all these. He, he created this huge wage bill because he knew he wasn't paying it, or he thought he wasn't paying it, because he was only going to pay this wage bill for two months and then say to them, guys, we need to chip over your contracts. But none of that happened. So we kind of got it right, but we got it wrong because it wasn't the EBTs that that put Rangers that that. Finished strangers in the, the February. It, 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 it was actually, it was like Al Capone. Al Capone didn't get done for killing people. He got done because, mm. you know what I mean? He's, he's kind of a, a financial affairs. So that's yes. what happened. It was, so as some, it was right. as somebody once said to me, gangsters always drive at 30 miles an hour in built up areas because they don't want to get caught for speed. They don't want to get caught for speeding. <laughs> <laughs> when it doesn't really so, matter. <laughs> So we kind of got it it's right, but we kind of got it wrong. Because it wasn't actually, we all thought October, we all looked forward to everything in October comes, Rangers are gone. But the first tier tribunal was delayed as these things. And so he hadn't paid the tax, he hadn't paid the PAYE, as Robert's saying, he hadn't paid anything. So they had to go into administration because he has cash flow. And once they were in and, administration, and Robert, never coming out again. Well, and, and so that was the the thing, Robert. We lose to Rangers, then we, we, we beat Inverness Cali at home, then we lose to Hearts at Tyne Castle, and then we have the game at, at Rugby Park. 
Um, well, we're 3 0 down at half time. And increasingly, the fear that Andrew sort of alludes to there increasingly, the fear is that they might actually get into administration, get their points penalty. And because we are losing these games, and that actually they could get their points penalty and still be in the title. Mm. And, 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 and that would be the ultimate disaster. So at 3 0 down at half time at Kilmarnock, this is what's looming large. Uh, so, Robert, talk, talk us through the, the that that command the game. Where were you? How did you? What was going on? Etc. I started watching it from Hong Kong, or, um, and and I think Lennon, you know, Lennon had said that you know he was forty five minutes away from getting fired that day. I think it was in October or something like that. Um, and second half, um, James Forrest. 20 years old, mm-hmm. young kid, maybe had his most important 45 minutes. He was going to stay in the hopes, but I don't think there was any hopes that they had to go green or something. But, um, so Forrest Kerr set up Stokes for two goals, for the spark to come back, go through a header for the equaliser. And even after that, Joe Marlon could have won it. They missed that. Absolutely, set up. I think also Big Fraser pulled off a great save, and then I think we had a chance to win it right at the end. But was, you know, half time you would have taken 3 3 any day, and it was the turning point in the season for Neil Lennon and for the team. I think they gave the team great belief that you know they could come back from adversity, and uh, they really kicked on for that result. Tremendous run, um, which drained back, you know, what had been. I, I think Rangers were 15 points ahead by the day we played at home. So it was, it was critical. Um, yeah, I mean, could Rangers have survived the season and still won the league? That's maybe you know, some matter for some debate. I couldn't remember Andrew when the when the first strike, you know, when the Justice Smith decision, you know, ridiculous. Well, that was different. That's different from the the tax tribunal. That was a football. The, the, the Lord Nemo Smith thing was two thousand two thousand and twelve, and at that time, the tax the had found in favour. The the tribunals had found in favour of Rangers. They weren't liable for any tax. It twice found in favour of Rangers, 2012, 2014, and it took until it went to the, the, the appeal court uh, in 2015 that it found it, that it said they were emollients and they should have paid their tax and national insurance on them. And then in 2017, they'd appealed it and the appeal was thrown out. So this was a lot. These are two different, you know, they're all these kind of time scales. Yeah. The decision that Rangers have not enjoyed any... Um, competitive advantage through the use of the EBTs was an astonishing decision. I read the whole 140 page report and the dissenting view by a judge whose name was Kim, I remember, a lady judge, no, was a... Th- these, are two, these are two different things. Lord Nemo Smith was a football decision and the, the HMRC, the first the t- 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 tribunal, See, because that was what footballers are saying, Lord Nemo Smith was saying there was no competitive advantage because at that time they decided they weren't liable to pay tax. The EBTs were okay. They'd, they'd kind of waved them through, apart from the dissenting judge, Judge Kim, if you remember, who said this is a, an abomination. And the other two guys, there was all sorts of stories yes. about the other two guys on the tribunal. It was, uh, it was uh, ridiculous, but the, the reality of the situation is that, you know, Rangers were running on empty. You know, Rangers' balance sheet was, yeah. was a busted flush probably by October. And yeah, the 5th, of, the 5th of November it was uh, when Rangers won 2-1 at home to the United. They played two games more than Celtic by then. They were 15 points ahead and Celtic went to Motherwell. If you remember that one, Stephen, they, they, they were still not in great form, but they kind of they scraped a two-one, 
and that was when it changed. Thereafter that, I think they won 17 straight games, Celtic, something. It changed, so, it was like bonfire night, you know? Bonfire of Rangers' vanities, you know? <laughs> like... The, the Kilmarnock one at Rugby Park, I can remember that day vividly. And there's good reason to remember it for two reasons. Number one, it was my son's first away game ever took him to. He was oh, only wow. seven. So he'll remember that for the rest of his days. But the other thing as well is, interestingly, it was the 30th anniversary of John Doyle's passing. And there was a, right. John Doyle's grave uh, is very, very close to Rugby Park. I didn't appreciate It's only about five minutes' drive from Kilmarnock's ground. And it was a, it was a Celtic Grave Society had a, a nice wee get-together and a lot of the, the ex-Celtic players turned up. <clears throat> and I was really optimistic we were going to win that day. My son's first away game, Johnny Doyle's memory. You know, and at half time, we're sitting there, me, me and uh, Michael, and um, he turns into me and he says, it's not supposed to be like this, Dad, is it? And I'm like, no, not really. But I'll tell you, I was so proud of the Celtic fans that day. One of the proudest days I've ever had. Because when the team came out for the second half, they got a massive uh, roar. Mm. And nobody turned against Lennon, nobody turned against the players. And I, I, I genuinely believe that the Celtic fans dragged them back into the game that day because see if the team had come out of the park to booze and jeers, they were done for. But yeah. the fact that the, 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 there was a huge roar, the, the fans got behind the team, that, that, that was the, um, the, 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 the main point that, that got us back into the game. Another thing is, well, I remember going home I think, I think our game kicked off early and I remember going home and I was literally lying on top of my bed uh, just yeah. sort of like relaxing, right? I, I was shattered, it was a long day and, and the phone went and I thought, Who, who's phoning at this time? It, it was only maybe about, it was early evening and it was a part of mine and he says, did you hear, did you hear? And I says, heard what? He says, uh, Gary Teal scored for St Mirren in 95 minutes at Ibrox and they've got a draw. So see if it's Celtic losing at half time and going further behind Rangers, who would obviously beat St Mirren quite convincingly. We we managed to get a draw that day, but it's really important to appreciate that that Gary Teal goal yep. from a Rangers perspective. Put them I was in a there. I was at Ibrox that day. I you, you'll, be, you'll be able to describe it, Andrew. I mean, the, 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 the you know the, the Rangers support don't take to that very very kindly. Yeah, yeah. No, you're you're dead right, and and that Celtic game as well. I, I think I'm right in saying it is the. It was the first time, I think it's still the only time in Celtic's history they've ever not lost a game from being 3-0, league game from being 3-0 down. Mm. Because under under Mowbray, the previous year was the first, uh, two years earlier, when they drew 3-3 to Rapid Vienna, if you if you remember out there in the Europa League group. That was, oh. and they, they come back the 3-0 down. That was the first time in their history they'd ever come back for 3-0 down in any competition. Mm. So the Comanic Day became the first time in their history in a league game they'd ever not lost a game from being 3-0 down I'm just uh, I just had a quick glance there at the record of the game and it's it's not quite what I remember because Celtic's first goal by Stokes was 73 minutes great we fired up after half time and our goals were in 73 76 and 80 minutes and and I, and I do remember at the time thinking there must be time to win this game, you know, to, to win. <laughs> yeah. The, as I said earlier, there were chances at both ends. It was, it was a, a schoolboy game in the last 10 minutes, just end to end. Yeah, Stokes fantastic. was amazing. I, I think Stokes, I mean, I know you mentioned James Forrest, and rightly so, but Stokes just took it by the scuff of the neck. Stokes really, like, that was one of his crown and glory days in a Celtic strip as I remember because he really did look at, you know, he dragged them. He really did drag them back into that game. It only surpassed by the Stokes performance for Hibs in the Scottish, in the Cup, Scottish Cup, Cup final. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say that when I think about the two games, the Stokes games, that's probably the two I think of. Mm -hmm. My, um, my boy was 18 months old at the time and someone was looking after him for one of the first times for the whole day so I promised my wife we would go out for the day and I remember we went in for something for some lunch at 3 now. and I switched yeah. my phone and I actually you know that way you were sort of you know you can be uptight when there's a Celtic game that you're having difficulty getting access to see I remember being quite relaxed at 3 now at half time I remember putting my phone off and thinking oh well by the time I switched this back on Neil Lennon will have been sacked 
Because it was that it was that way of a bit like the Mowbray defeat at Love Street that you think, right, if we're three 0 at half time, we might lose this four or five, and that's the type of result that it doesn't. His departure doesn't drag out. But you, you know, I'm just being. You start to become a bit pragmatic, and you go, well, benefit is his departure won't be dragged out. It's happening early on in the season. <laughs> It'll be tonight or tomorrow. They'll go yeah. a bit like Barnes had to go after the Inverness Cali defeat. A bit like Mowbray had to go after the St Mirren defeat. That you're thinking it's not going to get dragged out. So that's actually quite good. It's all going to happen really quickly in October. We've still got a chance. <laughs> I remember just thinking all that, and then. <laughs> You know, later on in the day, switch the phone back on. You're like, wow, we drew that. And a bit like you, Robert, my immediate reaction was, oh, it's a bit of a disappointment that we couldn't gain. If we got three goals back, why couldn't we have got a fourth? <laughs> that, was your, that was your reaction. So, um, so yeah, that was... And, and Lennon himself says, I, I don't know, did he say... To the, I don't know, you'll have got the post-match press conference stuff, Andrew. Did he say yeah. that he said to the players at half time? I'm going to get fired, or was it just him thinking at half time? I think I'm it was just fired. My, my memory, because he, 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 you know, he'd, he'd refer back to it, obviously, when they won the league and all that, you know, like, because that was the kind of, that was such a pivotal moment. Um, but he said, I'm out. I, you know, I think it was more him in his head thinking, I'm gone here. I'm gone here if we don't turn this around. And you could so, all this stuff about players only playing for him and all that, and you saw it in the second half. As you say, Robert, it's a lot later than they left a lot later than I'd thought. You know, in your mind, how your mind plays tricks with you. <laughs> you know, they only really got it together the last twenty-five minutes or whatever, twenty-seven minutes. But they yeah, like, a bit like the se centenary season. My memory of the centenary season in the cup final was thinking there was loads of time left in the game for us to win it when we were still losing, <laughs> when they were, when they were losing. But, but just at the time, you just thought, oh, we've still got time to win this game, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I know, it's weird how, how your memory really, really does play tricks with you. So, so you're right, Robert, that, 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 that changes the dynamic of everything. Um, we, we beat Aberdeen at home 2-1, Although we, we then draw nil nil at home at home to Hibs, but thereafter, it is just win after win, after win. There's lots of one goal victories: two one against Kilmarnock at home, one nil against Hearts at home, one nil away to Dundee United, two one at Dunfermline at home, two one away to Motherwell, as you as you point out, um, and all through that period. And then we get to it wasn't a New Year game; it was a 28th of December game at Celtic Park against Rangers, uh, Robert. So. Your, your thoughts, just but during that November, all I remember through that October and November is every single Radio Scott. It was Radio Scotland that moved over to by that point and moved away from Clyde. It was too, and every single program in Radio Scotland was talking about the tax with Rangers every single week. It was just this momentum, as as you pointed out, Andrew. It was just this snowball rolling down the hill of 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 the debt that they were in. So. So, Robert, what's your memories of that October, November, December, and then the the twenty eighth of December Rangers game? The game that I remember, apart from the Rangers game, was the game against Hearts at Parkhead when we won one 0 and Fraser Foster saved a penalty in the very last minute of the game, and I think we're still about five points behind Rangers at that point. Um, Big Victor had smacked one in from about 25 yards with the outside of his right foot, right in the roof of the net. It was a bit of an ugly game. We hadn't played well. Great goal by Wanyama and the Foster's penalty save. I can't remember who took the penalty for Hearts, but that was vital. And I think Rangers dropped points that day as well, which meant that come 28th of December, we played them... Uh, was it a Wednesday night game? Or was it yeah. just a... Was it no, just it was a Wednesday. A, well, Wednesday night. No, it was I a think, in the middle Wednesday of the night, night game, aye. I got up to watch it in the middle of the night in Hong Kong. And, um, yeah, uh, we just we needed to win that game to go top of the league, to replace them at the top. And Joe Ledley got on the end of a, a corner at the back post, got up well, uh, put it away. My other memory of that game is Foster made a couple of, made a brilliant save early on from Lee Wallace. Um, early in the first half, fantastic reaction save, which we saw so many times from 
from Stud. And uh, I think in the second half, we ended up winning out, deserved winners, um, even though it stayed at 1 0. I mean, that was, yeah, we, did, we didn't look back after that. You know, we stayed top, uh, irrespective of uh, a 10 point penalty that was coming from Rangers. So. I hope I'm no misremembering this, and Stephen, you'll tell me if I was. Was that no the McCulloch tackling Bernard Kyle that night? That yes. Kyle was kind of. Yeah. That was the. Was that, never the really... was that not the Scottish Cup tie the previous season? Um, you're right, Andrew, because mm. Kyle, I thought, had been tremendous in his first 18 months for the club. He was really doing a great job in the mid- midfield, and we never really saw the best of him again after. He was out for a long time. After that tackle, right over next to the dugout, as I recall. Was that that night, or am I getting mixed up? Stephen was saying he thought it was maybe the... No, you're right. Was it that was... night, definitely. <laughs> All right. You've got a really good memory for this, like, uh, Robert. Is, uh, like, uh, has he got... It's almost kind of photographic. It's, it's amazing. I love yeah, it. So... Now, some of the other games in that October-November period, Harry... You know, I don't recall them at all. Uh, I remember the excitement of being on a good run, winning yeah. every week, narrowing the gap every week. You know, you don't know that Rangers are going to go bust during the course of the season and in a penalty. There was some talk about it. But there was also a feeling that, okay, somebody might, you know, fund them through the season, you know, obviously they'd lost David Murray, who'd been funding them in all sorts of ways for, for many, many years. Craig White, you know, with his off the radar wealth, as reported by Keith Jackson, turned out to have uh, nothing, nothing of the sort. So, um, you know, at the end of the, you know, at that stage, I'm really just concentrating on what's happening in the field and. Getting in front of them by the turn of the year was, was very significant. And, um, clearly, as we progressed into January, then, you know, the wheels were coming off. And, I was, mm. and you know, they started to drop more points. Mm. They were under a lot of pressure. So I, think Lennon, I seem to remember when at some point. It might have been the end of the season. Uh, Alan Coyce that had to deal with a whole number of issues as a manager at one point, which managers should not have to deal with. So Lenin, I think the league must have been won, safely won. You know, he expressed some sympathy for you know what Alan Coyce had, had to deal with in the previous months. Stephen, um, that that run we talked about, uh, Robert picked out that the Hearts game, and and that's the game I think that we went top of the league. And I remember Victor Wanyama, you know, it was a great strike. But oh. the other thing I remember was I'd been unsure about Fraser Foster in the, in the in initially um, in his in his first loan period because um, he was young. I think he'd only become a prefect. He'd only become a goalkeeper of any sort at about seventeen or, or eighteen or something like that. And and here he yeah. was at twenty two, twenty three, playing for Celtic. So. In his whole career, you know, his whole life, I should say, he'd only been a goalkeeper, and I felt lots of his errors were decision making errors. He would go come out to someone when he should have stayed in, stay in when he should have come out, and lots of that. And the thing that really struck me was he'd looked nowhere in the couple of penalties that had been against him prior to that, and it was the it was the very last minute of the game that Hearts got the penalty, and mm-hmm. you're just thinking, bollocks, we were going to go top of the league. And then oh, you're just resigning to the fact that Hearts are going to score the penalty. And he saved it. And I think for me, that was the, not the commandment game. For me, that was the game that was transformational in my thoughts on the on the league season, that, that Hearts game. Because one, it was as, again, people forget, when Yama was a prospect who was coming into the team and he wasn't getting a game every week and it was round about them, that, it was round about the November time that when Yama became a player, uh, a, a fixture and then Fraser Foster saves a penalty. Um, so that whole spelling right up to the Rangers game on the 28th. Anything stand out for you, uh, Stephen? Yeah, I've got to say that the, the one game that stands out for me, you don't very often get games played on Christmas Eve. 
and that the Kilmarnock game was played on Christmas Eve. And very, very unusually, Rangers played at Love Street at the same time, because normally these days, for the last 20 years or so, we, Celtic and Rangers don't play at the same time. You know, one plays on a Saturday, one plays on a Sunday, one plays at lunchtime, one plays at three o'clock. So, I, I, again, my son's seven, it's Christmas Eve, and we're, we're watching the game. Celtic's winning quite comfortably, Rangers are winning at half time, and then halfway through the second half, a massive roar goes on the stadium. One of the, one of the roars that we're old enough to remember back in the days when it was three o'clock kickoffs, and, and you would turn and say, um, Aberdeen scored against Rangers, you know, because you just know, because that, that, it starts off as a wee sort of, um, just a wee noise, and it builds up into a crescendo to a big massive roar, and, and, and everybody looks at each other and goes, oh yes. And my son's looking at me and he's going, what, what, what's they cheering for, Dad? And I said, St Martin scored against Rangers. How do you know? I said, no, you need to believe me. And then five minutes later, a second roar went up, even louder. And he said, do you think St Martin scored again? I went, yes. And obviously there's a guy running about you somewhere that we are radio with some degree or a phone, and everybody began to give the thumbs up that, that St Martin had... Been, and I think Aaron Moy scored the winner. I don't know, mate. I'm, I'm sure that J.D. Aaron Moy scored against Rangers and he scored a cracking goal. And as everybody has been saying there, that, that this good run that we're on, it's not just the fact Celtic's in a good run. They're not playing well. They're, they're not getting results. So that was the game before we played them on the Wednesday night between Christmas and New Year. And I was never so confident you know, for years that we were going into a game on forum and they were going into a game um, not playing well and, and we were going to win that. But the, the, the game was tighter than it was. It was actually a, a fantastic goal by Joe Ledley, which won the game. But what sticks in my mind that, that day is, and, and Robert might not know this, but the other guys will, it, it was a, the, the weather was terrible in Glasgow. It was like hurricanes. Really, really e e excessive winds, storms. storms. And there was actually a rumour the day before the game that the game would get postponed because the forecast was that Glasgow was to get up mm. with these really, really strong winds. And it was an awful, uh, uh, awful conditions for players to play football. And I just remember being re really relieved at the end of the game that we got that game played and we beat them. Yeah, you're right, by the way. I just looked it up, Stephen. Uh, Aaron Moy scored that day. McGowan got the other one, so that would have probably, like, I mm. suppose, like, like, it was quite a day, uh, and it was 2-1. Um, I, I, I didn't even recollect that. I think I must have been off that week or whatever. I can't remember, because... I tended to be if I wasn't at Celtic, I was at Rangers. So, like, uh, and I think I was at a lot more Rangers that season. Bizarrely, like, just sometimes the way the games work out, you know. Like, uh, I think the Celtic play quite a few Sunday games then, so I would tend to be following. Well, would have been the Europa League, so it would have been a lot yeah. of Sunday games for, for yeah, us. Yeah, so and Rangers, uh, of course, weren't in Europe, so they would have been playing in the Saturdays. So yeah, yeah. So um, we are top of the league. We beat Rangers uh, at home, um, and then we are winning games. We have, um, and I'm going to slightly change the order I was going to do this, because I'll make the break where we talk about the League Cup after an event that happens in February. Uh, so we go, we beat Dunfermline on the way 3-0. We beat Dundee United at home 2-1. We beat St Mirren away 2-0. We win at Tynecastle 4-0, and then we beat Inverness at home 1-0. Um, and then an event happens that just transforms Scottish football. Probably, possibly, at least for, for it's not finished yet, but at least for 30 years, 40 years. Um, so before I go into that event and where you were in that JFK moment of where you were when you find out, um, anything memorable about those games through January for anybody? Robert, anything? Maybe. I don't recall anything exceptional except that we were winning. We were getting clean sheets, but I can't remember who was in central defence that season. Kelvin Wilson would be one. I think it was he played on that side. I think it was Leuven's mostly. Hmm. My story that she'd fell out of favour, I think Leuven's hmm. was in there. And, uh, and um, might be Mulgrew as well. I think Mulgrew came on to a game that season as the season progressed. That's right. I saw Thomas Rogner. Like I was, when I was looking at that Motherwell game earlier on, mm. he he mm. played, but obviously he could never stay fit because I always had some kind. Of, you know, I always thought that he could have been a decent enough player if he, if his fitness hadn't let him down so regularly. So Rangers have been bought by. Um, sorry. Given that 
you know, it was quite a new defence, really. That mm -hmm. season, Matthews yep. was the new. Did we sign Lustig in that window? January. January. No, and it turns out to be, you know, a bit of a legend for, <laughs> you know, for various reasons. So, uh, <laughs> stats and stuff like that. But um, it was a pretty new defence. Ezeguiri out injured for most of the season. Storage, I think, got eased to the side. And, you yes. know, so maybe Yama's playing there sometimes, Ronya, Mokuru, so... We were getting quite a few clean sheets in this winning run, which is always good when that happens. So you, you'd mentioned earlier, uh, uh, or someone had mentioned about the wealth off the radar comment. I remember, so you get into your thing, Andrew, I remember that through more into 2012, just through what I was doing with, with work, I was doing a lot of stuff down in London, and I happened to then start to interact with a lot of people. Uh, you'll know this, Robert. I started to find out that in the city of London, in the sort of sub-100 million pound mark, there's a lot of dodgy people around there, really, really dodgy people. Um, and they were and, and and they were all the people who seemed to be interacting with Rangers, a lot, all these people. They were all, I mean, they had money and they, they interacted with people with money, but the sort of 50 to 100 million pound band, um, I always say that they, they, they saw the law was was like I always used to say they saw the law a bit like one of these uh, rulers you got at school the shatterproof rulers you could bend it quite a bit yeah. before the one day it would just snap and break but but you had that flexibility that the law wasn't fixed in stone for these people um, and somebody told me this brilliant tale uh, about uh, Craig White's wealth off the radar and if you remember there's lots of pictures of him with celebrities and what they said was what had happened was there was some big charity event taking place, it wouldn't happen now, taking place in St. Petersburg. It was, you know, some sort of United Nations charity event to, where, you know, it's like 50 grand a table type thing. And that Craig White had bought a table at this event. And then when the sort of hello type photographers going around taking pictures, Craig White, he hires two attractive ladies, I don't want to sound sexist and call them dolly birds, but he hires two attractive ladies with him to go to this event so that he, you know, people like taking pictures of beautiful people. And so he goes around with them and gets his picture taken with all the famous people there. there. George Clooney's there. And, and so if you look back at Craig White in lots of pictures at the time, in particularly the likes of the Daily Record of Craig White, to illustrate his wealth off the radar, he's black tie and he's taken with these celebs. But it's all the one night... <laughs> It's all the same night in St. Petersburg where all the celebs are there. And this person in the city was telling me it was all part of his plan to portray this image that he had greater wealth than he had, that he'd gone to this event. Um, I always felt the, the Rangers going bust was a bit like one of these films, you know, in where somebody sells their soul to the devil and then uh, the devil then comes to reap his reward and get the soul back up and everything goes to shit for them thereafter. And they're, they're desperately trying to avoid the devil reclaiming the, reclaiming the soul that he sold to them. And and this was just their comeuppance. I mean, for me, football is about the joy of the moment and celebrating your history. And for 10 plus years, they stole that from us. So I have absolutely zero sympathy for them. They robbed, they robbed us of stuff mm. through, through everything they did. So I had no... No sympathy. Harry, they, Harry, they didn't they, they only, only rob us. I keep making that point to um, Thrones, who are St Mirren fans, Motherwell fans, Hearts fans, and I'll say, but it's just Celtic that get robbed here. They robbed you as well. And one of, one of the, the best things I think happened from Rangers' demise was from the years 2012 to 2016, but when Rodgers took over at Celtic, there was a great spread for, for the, tro the cup trophies, not in the league. But there was a great spread of the domestic trophies in Scottish football where, you know, St Mirren won a trophy, Hearts won a trophy, uh, Hibs won a trophy. And uh, Johnston. And St Johnston, Inverness, Ross County. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that's a sort of like a, a wee golden period for, for the for, for the, the non-Glasgow clubs, if you like, uh, because Rangers were out in the bracket at that point. On a, on a critical point, you could say Celtic should have done better. But shouldn't they be losing finals to you know, Kilmarnock and... Uh, games at hand and to, to hearts and things like that, but but you know, to be fair, that th those teams were cheated as well. It wasn't just Celtic. Mm -hmm. I know, and, and some of the EBT victims for 
Queen of the South, who lost the Scottish Cup final. Yeah. The Rangers, Falkirk, lost the Cup final. Air United, lost. So teams that rarely have their day in the sun came up against, you know, this debt fueled Rangers team. Um, it was a comment that I read that when Rangers won the league at Easter Road in that shameful match in 2005 when Tony Mowbray's hips wouldn't cross the halfway line. Every single Rangers player on the field had an EBT. Mm-hmm. The day we lost the league at Fort Park. So it but was... they're, they're not the only cheats. I mean, my uh, friend's a St Johnston season ticket holder and his resentment of hearts. And you speak to Hibs fans, you know, they talk about the 5 1. That was a debt field hearts team. You know, like uh, everybody cheats. It's not just Rangers in the sense that anybody who goes into administration mm-hmm. or liquidation or whatever, they're all cheats. And my uh, St Johnston pal gets really upset about it because so many in Scotland did. They were spending beyond their means. So I said they weren't the they weren't the one and only they weren't the biggest and baddest but 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 they weren't the one and only. I think it's yeah. it's whether you're right cheating, things. Whether you're sorry, cheating, or whether you're cheating the taxpayer, there's there's a difference, I think. So uh, hmm. that that's so. that's my point. Uh, there's cheating because you're you're just accumulating debt, and that's that bad financial management by the bank and not pulling that in earlier, or there's cheating because you're getting the taxpayer to fund your success. And that, for me, is why it's unforgivable for Rangers. Do you know what annoys me about all this? Like, uh, the kind of moral crusades that Celtic supporters go on. And I've I've had my back and forth with a lot of them. That season, Celtic paid, sorry, played, uh, this season we're talking about, they played Atletico Madrid, right? Atletico Madrid, who's... uh, whose uh, president come out and said, some people have bank debt, we've got tax debt. They owed the tax man 56 million mm-hmm. and not a single Celtic sport, as far as I'm concerned, because I've spoken to a lot of them online. I said, did you contact UEFA to say Celtic should be back? Or they should get some kind of recompense for what happened to them in the Europa League against a team who had a 56 million pound tax debt. But they, but they, they seem to think, well, that's no. They they wrote back to me and said, "Oh no, that's no our concern." I said, "Yes, it is. You played Atletico Madrid. You were losing to a team that shouldn't have been allowed in, but you only seem to care about Rangers. Why do you only care about Rangers?" Well, he, here's well, I agree with you to some extent, but here's the other point: it wasn't my money that went into Atletico Madrid, but it was my money that went into Rangers. But they surely, took my, you know, they took you my think... personal. They, I worked. I was getting home. During that period, at 10, 11 o'clock at night, to fund Rangers, if you want to really strip it out. That's why my preference would be that that club went bust, closed down, mothballed, whatever it was, and they had to start in whatever league Gretner started in. That would have been my the Craig, preference. The Craig Wright thing's a funny one because one of my neighbours, who I know really well, um, his wife is related to Craig Wright, the first cousin. And I remember saying to my neighbour, I said, oh, by the way, I said, um, that, that Craig White guy's a billionaire. And he went, no, he's not. And I said, OK, right, he's not a billionaire, he's a millionaire. And he went, no, he's not. And he taught me a wee bit about Craig White that, that he knew. And I remember, Brian will be able to remember uh, this uh, better than me. One of our colleagues put a, a great um, uh, article in the early days of, of the Celtic Underground website and he basically Googled Craig Bites' background, right? Just basic, a, a Google search. And he came up with this stuff, and he basically debunked everything that Keith Jackson or, or any of the other ju- journalists had said about Craig White. And it became so obvious at that point that Craig White was not what he was portrayed to be. But we all knew that, but nobody from a Rangers background, in terms of their support base, could could, could do a Google search or... or, or, or or could um, or could delve into it, and somebody actually made a point to me that it, it, it really goes um, back to our, our roots as a club. It, you know, like our, I would imagine that, that our, our father, certainly in my own case, my dad was a trade unionist, very keen trade unionist, and he used to question everything at any given time. Not because he, he was being uh, negative, but because he could see through things that people had said to him through his life that didn't materialise, and he used to say, "No, that you, you need to look closer at these things." There's very often you need to scratch underneath it. 
and nobody did that with Craig White. And I find but, that astonishing that the Glasgow Herald, the Scotsman, what I would call the heavyweight newspapers, could we, be uh, a, 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 an insight into Craig White to, to find out what was happening. I wrote a piece about the fact that he didn't have he didn't have the kind of money that was getting talked about. And do you know why I wrote the piece? Because he he, he employed a PR firm called McCary and, and Hay, I think they were called. And you seen you spoke to them. And I says, I've worked this out. I says, has he even got, I've worked this out at the back of a fag packet economics, but he needs at least 55 million to actually, to reinvigorate Rangers. And they went, well, he didn't have that. He's not, he's not going to put that in. He's not, that's not going to harm. I said, well, you're, you're going nowhere. But into the bargain, people say that everybody, oh, I said he'd all this money. The Rangers board at the time were selling uh, Murray. You can't sell to this guy. I mean, we, we shouldn't even rewrite history. They didn't want him because they knew, they knew he was a spiv. They knew he was a no user. If you remember all this, the, the back and forth and telling him, he said, I have to sell. He said, my hands are tied because the bank are telling me. Because the one thing Craig White was going to get, Craig White was getting the bank back their 18 million from ticketers, from Rangers. You know, he was mortgaging future mm -hmm. season uh, ticket sales. So he, got, he was getting them back and all the bank wanted was out of it. They wanted some money back because Murray cost the bank 330 million or whatever with his debt mounting. And so they wanted at least something back from yeah. that. So everybody, yes. everybody knew all this. You know, this isn't he. This wasn't he known yes. subsequently. Everybody knew all this. There's, there's one other wee personal memory around about that time. We played Hearts and we pumped them 4 0, I think, at 10 uh -huh. Castle. 4 0, yeah. I was coming at my work at half past five that night. I thought I was late. And um, Paul McBride getting it off, the guy who was very friendly with Lennon, the lawyer. Oh, and yeah. um, I said to Paul McBride, it was just the two years in the lift. And I said to Paul McBride, are you going to the game? And he went, aye. And I says, well, you're running a bit late. It's half five the noon. You've got to get to Tidecastle. And he went, I know, I know. He says, I'm getting picked up. And he actually sprinted out the door. And it's very sad to say, Paul McBride died just a matter of weeks after that. And the only reason I'm raising that is, is that I, I know somebody who's close to Neil Lennon. And it affected him really badly. He was very, very friendly with Paul McBride. And at that period must have been very difficult for Lennon. Yeah, I never sure. Paul McBride up in his... Uh, Park Circus, it was mad, it had all these, it was like, you know, like the stuff that Michael Jackson was buying, you know, like these Egyptian busts and all that, it was a really weird decor, it was a really, really weird decor, and I said, oh, do you have any children? And he went, has nobody told you I'm gay? And then his partner come in kind of thing, I went, oh, no, I'm sorry, I just, you know, I wasn't crying, it was just like, you know, these kind of questions you ask when you're doing a profile of someone, you know? But it was, it was yeah. good value, it was great value. But the Celtic Sports hated it because he said referees, because he'd been a linesman, he said referees are not biased. And I got I got so much stick for that. And I said, I'm only reporting what the guy said to me. But there you go. Down the side. So, on to the moment yeah. when it all happened. I can remember vividly where, where I was. I was I was in a meeting in, in an office in, in Livingston. And uh, I was with a colleague who's not a football fan. And my phone was on silent, but it was on vibrate. You know how when it's on vibrate, it still makes that. Uh -uh. And halfway through the meeting, my phone was in my case behind me. It just went. Uh -uh, uh -uh. It just literally <laughs> nonstop for about the last. I, I'm desperately trying to wind up the meeting because I'm because it was that way. You knew it was by this point. You knew it was coming, and I'm sitting there going, and, and we walk out the door. And I've got a big grin in my face. And my colleague who knows nothing about football says. What's up with you? And, and what was going on with your phone? And before I'd even got to it, I said, Rangers have gone bust. <laughs> so, R Robert, can you remember, can you remember where you were, where, how you heard about it? Because it would have been different time zone for you. Yeah, eight hours further on. I tried it. What time did you get that information? That would have been uh, mid-afternoon. That would have been yeah. round, uh, round about two, three o'clock. It was. I yeah. seem to recall not knowing until the next morning, Paul called time. So I think I'd kind of missed the news late at night. And I think my first reaction to it was, okay, 10-point penalty, we're going to win the league. You know, it's, the league's all over. That was my first impression. Then I kind of had a look at what had happened, and so it was a, it's a creditor's voluntary administration scheme, which, so I suppose, tough, tough and fair on paper, we're being tasked to, you know, try and, you know, restructure the debt, you know, try and get HMRC to accept a small payout. And I think because the transfer window was, was over, they couldn't sell any players. 
Would that be right, Andrew? They would be outside the transfer window. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they couldn't sell any players because they'd sold. They were, uh, they were, Jel- Jelovic, she gets sold. They were trying to push through They sold them that. a couple of weeks before. They sold them a couple of weeks before, try to stave yeah. it off. Yeah, well, and then they were trying to push. They were trying to push through the Daniel Kuzan coming in thing as well. That's right. The, the only club that ever went into administration and tried to increase their costs. What <laughs> yeah, that one? I know. Duff and well, Phelps, hadn't it? Well, no, Duff and Phelps. That's just a company name. But Paul Whitehouse, uh, sorry, David Whitehouse and Paul Clark. It, it was funny because we met them that then that weekend, like. Uh, but it was funny. Sorry, but I, I digress. But, uh, Stephen, sorry, you were. Uh, I think you were going around. Sorry, this is a circular it, thing about where you were. You couldn't raise assets. You couldn't raise substantial amounts of cash by, you know, selling half the team, and, you know, so if the administration had happened six weeks earlier, say beginning of January, would they have sold a bunch of players and then just played young boys just to keep the lights on by a bit of time? So it was a bit curious for me that they didn't do that. You know, they would have got money from Davis and Naismith, McGregor, you know, one or two others. They could have probably raised 20 million, you know, possibly at a stretch. Um, they, they, they didn't do that. And so they were they're kind of hamstrung straight away. There was there weren't assets to sell other than you know, you're not going to sell Murray Park or, you know, a piece of real estate very, very quickly. These things take time. So there were and, and I think there was also very little chance of HMRC agreeing to any uh, reduced claim on their part because from a tax point of view Rangers was a test case for many, many other EBT schemes, which uh, HMRC were trying to close down. One or two football clubs, a couple of the banks had used it. And so Rangers, in some respects, were a little bit unlucky to be the guinea pig in this you know, HMRC initiative. And, uh, you know, there was, there was almost no chance of survival, quite frankly. They'd only gotten to St. Valentine's Day by virtue of not paying any taxes for maybe six months. And even at that stage, and even with the gel of it, money. So I think strategically, the Rangers board probably handled it wrongly. And they should have realised that there was a solvency or an insolvency issue at the earlier stage, and they might have been able to get some wiggle room if they'd used the of January as a, as a fire suit. And, and that, that was the thing, um, saying so, uh, that was the odd thing, that we everybody knew it was coming, and, it finally, and, and, and by this point, I think certainly through the January, people are saying, well, that the, the crux of it will be February, round about February, because the problem is Clubs get their season book money in, they start, they spend it, spend it, spend it, spend it, spend it, and then the point where they hit having absolutely nothing left, but they've still got wages to go. The bit they always have to bridge is in the January, February, March time before the new season books go on sale in, in April. So everybody knew it was around that time uh, that the issue would be. And Robert, so the point you just touched on again, that really odd that they didn't, if they'd done it in January and had the fire sale. Any thoughts on that, Robert? Can I forget that they owed the kids over 20 million as well. So the way they were operating with season ticket sales was, you know, they were spending well in advance. And, uh, you know, they, they were the second largest budget. You know, they would have had to agree to some, you know, 10 p.m. Yeah, I don't know what it was at the end of the day. So that weekend, um, so the well, the weekend after Duff and Phelps were appointed, so we were called up to it was a Saturday. There was a Saturday game, and we were called up to the kind of blue room at Ibrooks to meet them. And it was uh, it was David Whitehouse and Paul Clark, and they looked like these kind of guys, you know, like their office would be behind some kind of like a 
bike shed down some alleyway, you know what I mean, just a plate on it, kind of thing, you know, the, the certain, I mean, I'm not a great dresser, but, you know, the kind of slightly tatty suits and kind of crumbs down, kind of one lapel, you know, and the kind of tie, not quite tied properly. They yeah, were the, kind the of, cuffs are a bit frayed and, yeah. The cuffs aye. are a bit frayed, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and it was like, but they were nice enough guys. But because I'd done a lot of stuff on Dundee, if you remember, Dundee got their CBA yeah. through because, oh, what do you know? And I'd spoke to a lot of insolvency, people that had done insolvencies at football clubs, never heard of these guys because none of the rest of them wanted to touch it, the, the experience. They didn't want to go near Rangers because it's mm. so toxic. So they couldn't get people who knew the terrain when you have a club that goes into administration. You know, because Brian Jackson was the kind of, he was the red adair of administrations. Mm -hmm. He would come in and firefight and he'd got Dundee through it, through it, he'd got Harps through it, when it looked like both of those clubs were going to be liquidated. But they weren't. And it somehow, somehow Dundee, it turned out that uh, HMRC thought they owned, they, they, they were owed more than 25% of Dundee's debt, but when it came to it, it was 24.9% or something, so the, although they voted against the CV, CVA, ever, all the other creditors who just happened to make 75.1%, so they managed <laughs> to get the CVA through. But when it came to Rangers, we all knew that, it, but, but it was weird, like Clark and Whitehouse, because that first day, I said to them, you can't get a CVA through, and they said, what? I said. No, HMRC, as a rule, vote down CVAs in football. If there's any tax avoidance, they vote them down. It's their policy. I'd spoken to HMRC, who'd said it was their policy. And you look through every... But, but so even though they were voting down, at other clubs, like Dundee, they could vote down their CVA, mm. but the CVA could still get through. That could never happen to Rangers. And I always remember, mm. and I love Roddy for Scythe, and Roddy says, oh, I've spoke to HMRC, said... You know, they, they would be favourable to consider some kind of settlement. I said, that's just not true. That's just not true. But these two guys didn't have a clue. Clark and Whitehouse, they just did not have a clue. They just weren't. It was Football was completely alien to them. They tried to actually do things by the book. What they should have done was said, we need to liquidate this club right away. See if they mm. liquidated it and within a month and during the season. And they would say, you need to readmit us this new Rangers or whatever, the new co, you need to readmit us because otherwise your, your, your fixture list is completely destroyed. So you would have to have a completely void season. Because I thought if I had been advising them, I could have saved Rangers. Like, uh, I don't want to tell anybody, but you could have saved Rangers. You could have saved I Rangers. Know, I remember reading um, at the time, uh, and, and I'm bringing this up because you might be able to shed some light on it, that Craig White was in court looking for for the administ administration and there was two choices he got to choose his administrators or, or the or the, the judge did and the yeah. judge said i leave it to craig white to decide and i remember whoever whichever article it was whichever journalist that was writing it said you have never seen relief in a man's face in your life that that when he got to to, to pick the administrators who were the two guys you're you're talking about here right so that always struck me as very funny if you got yeah, the administration yeah, yeah. Why are you allowed to decide? Why are you allowed to choose your administrators? That didn't make any sense. I suppose it, it happened in all the other clubs. I can remember it happened right going back to Airdrieonians, and if you remember their kind of liquidation process. Does, does, does the court not normally um, appoint an administrator? I don't. I, I, I don't no. think so. I think you can. You can scan no, a bit. No, because your your, your your business is still trading. You're just in financial mm. difficulty. You've not gone bust, yeah. so your business is still training, so you're still in control of your business. And you're saying, look, we've got this he problem. Could, yeah. yeah, we're going to bring these guys in, in control. Who, who will help me administer through. Because the whole concept of this is we're going to administration to see what we need to do to agree creditors taking a hit and everything that needs to happen so that we can actually trade through this and come yes. out the other side and continue trading. So from that perspective, you're in control of that. The administrators... Are supposed to, um, they're supposed to adhere to all the law and do things the right way, and 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 so yes, you want you want guys that you're comfortable with using, but the, the react, but in terms of why the court doesn't need to do it, is because these guys are all then going to abide by the law and do things legally the right way, and they'll not keep a business trading and suddenly materialise an extra 
X percent of debt, so that the so that the people who'd vote against it would be at twenty four point nine percent. Is that? Oh, by the way, like, I'm, not, I'm not casting aspersions, I'm just saying that just happily worked out that way. Don't here's get me a, in trouble here, man. Here's a wee trivia question. What, which famous personality died in the same day that Rangers went into the administration? Oh, I seem to remember. Because uh, well, I, I, I looked it, I looked it up. Looked at, yeah. Uh, well, only because was, when I was looking, at, was looking at what happened and who died, so the name has already been mentioned at the beginning of the podcast as one of the people it, who passed away in this it, it was It was, it was Whitney Houston, and that's what sticks in my mind, because I was in Dublin for a family get-together. It was my, my in-law's wedding anniversary, and they'd, they'd, they'd been married in Dublin. And we went, to a, we went to a bar called Murray's Bar, of all places, in a corner street, a big huge bar. And it had these, uh, you know how the, 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 they've got the news screens on and, the, and they've got the ticker tape thing at the bottom coming up. And the next thing, Whitney Houston's dead. And everybody's like, oh, that, that's a shame. Young woman, you know, she was a great talent. And yeah, everybody's in a doubt. And all of a sudden at the bottom of the ticker tape, Glasgow Rangers go into administration. But, and, and then it leaves and it goes on to something else. And I thought, oh, did I read that right there? And I had to wait about two minutes till this thing come back on and it, as it goes in the V circle. <laughs> and... Um, that, that's how I found out. But, but my, my overwhelming reaction at the time was one of shock because despite everybody knowing that what was going to happen, see when it actually happened, I was still quite shocked. I don't know if every, if you guys feel the same. That, that kind of happens to you. You know, even when you, a lot of time in life when you expect something, you know something's happening, but when it does actually happen, you, you still can have that sense of shock. Another thing as well is yeah. I, I thought that we are going to win this league now. Clearly we're going to win it. It's not even up for debate. And and my my mind went went ahead of me in as much as we could win the Champions League ne- next season, we'll get the Champions League money. They're clearly yeah. skint. But whichever form they come back in, that they're, 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 they're going to be skint for years. So it became obvious at that point that we were going to be in the ascendancy for, for years to come. Years definitely, to come. definitely. But you know my memory, I actually asked in the desk, I said, look, see for the Sunday paper, can I write the anatomy of a fall? Because I knew people that had been... Uh, witnesses at the first tier tribunal like uh, so I thought I'll write through about the CBTs and how they're going to get hammered by da 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 and he said oh no you can do it you can do it so one of the first witnesses I spoke to he says I've been at the first tier tribunal he said and the revenue are not making a great go of it they're not making a great go of it he said I'm not convinced uh, Rangers are losing this he said this is 50 50 and instead of so what I wanted to write was all about how it got to this point how it got to this point that Rangers were really in the stim, you know, like, uh, and instead I, I got a new, a good news line. So I used it in the Sunday, right? And then Rangers tax case come out, says, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I see all the, see all the Rangers, like, uh, like a good news, a good new Rangers story, a good news Rangers story. It's just the way that people's minds works. It's like, this was all came for me. I intended to write a different story. I got quite a kind of interesting tip, but I wasn't saying they were definitely going to get, found in favour of in the first year drive, you know. But the Rangers tax case guy or guy or woman or whoever it is accused me of all sorts of things. It's like this is what happens in the Celtic sport a, a, a sex them it's become Trumpian in the sense that it doesn't matter what news is presented to them. They'll find an angle. They'll find they're trying to say that I'm trying to present a good news story for Rangers. I just found out inadvertently it was quite an interesting line. And I put it out. And I was getting all you know, he's accusing me of all sorts so he's not, you know, I always think, be careful with, with this kind of stuff. Because people are, the malice of forethought that you're accused of when you're just doing your job. And by the way, as it turned out, I was right. The first tier tribunal did find in favour of them. Like, yeah. I wasn't right. The guy was right. But it was just a story. And when I was trying to write another story, it just come up. Anyway, sorry, because it always bugged me about the Rangers tax case saying, oh, I'm trying to write a good news story and a bad weekend for Rangers. No, you're just trying to do your job. So, so now you've got that off your chest, Andrew. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's, 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 bugged, me 12... for, it's bugged me for 12 years. <laughs> um, so when all of this is going on, uh, at that time of the season, sort of autumn and into the spring, the, the, the League Cup uh, was uh, taking place and it would complete in March. So... Uh, we had the League Cup run. Uh, we'd beaten Ross County away. We'd beaten Hibs away, uh, 4-1. Uh, semi-final, we'd beaten Kilmarnock, 3-1. Uh, 
And then we've got, sorry, we've beaten Falkirk, I should say, 3-1. And we've got Kilmarnock in the final. So everything's all feeling good. We're on this winning run in the league. Uh, Rangers are dying. And we've got little Kilmarnock in the league cup final. So it looks like the first trophies in the bag. And Robert, it does not happen. What what went wrong with the League Cup final and the League Cup campaign? I remember watching the game and I think we hit the woodwork a couple of times and we had chances, but you know they had chances as well. I remember they had the, the Northern Irish coach Kenny Shields. I think his son was playing Dean Shields. So come on, got a good account for themselves, and uh, yeah, we looked like so we could have played all day and scored. Although throughout the season, we'd come up with a lot of late goals and late drama, but it was the end that you know I think the guy slung over a great cross, and uh, it was a Dutch guy, a Belgian guy, and found something um, and worked him or something like that. He uh, stuck it away, and. Um, to recall, we had a good penalty shot right at the end of the game, which, uh, which was a massive disappointment. And, you know, Lennon had already, you know, Lennon's early record at Hamden wasn't that great. Actually, he'd lost to North County in a Scottish Cup semi final. You know, we're going to talk about this season's Scottish Cup as well, another defeat at Hamden. So, uh, Hamden then was very different. Prospect for Celtic compared to Hamden in the last few seasons, for us, we've been almost unbeatable, except in extra times. So, uh, so, big disappointment because it looked like the treble was there on a plate, and uh, it turned out to be far from that. So, Stephen, um, what were your thoughts on it? Because this was part of that. Um, thing that started to take hold that Lennon couldn't win at Hamden um, uh, around this time with this result and obviously we'll get on to the Scottish Cup so what was your thoughts uh, you know, Rangers had gone into administration by the time the final came around so um, what was your thoughts on the final? First thing that, that, that sticks in my mind is we played in the, the change strip we didn't play in the hoops we played in the sort of white jersey with green sleeves and green shorts which I thought was was kind of peculiar um, because, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't normally... Uh, if I was a, sorry, if Kilmarnock are playing in blue and white stripes, then it, it shouldn't be a clash of colours. But it's one of those games that, um, as the game wore on, I, I just remember thinking to myself, we are not going to score here. I just can't see a goal coming. Because never at any point in the game did, did we put, play with any great cohesion and did we play with any great... Um, Flair, but we didn't really create chances. And um, to be honest, the, as the game wore on, I thought Celtic looked nervous. And then uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, I think it was maybe like 85 minutes that Kilman Kilman scored. And then there was a cavalry charge in the last five minutes as we try and get, you know, and uh, one of the guys has already said there, I think Stokes went down in, in the area for a penalty, but, which was a decent call, but we didn't get that. But you know, and um, if everything taken into consider, Kilmarnock were probably worthy winners that day because it wasn't one of those games where we pounded a team and they hit us in the break. Um, I, I don't think we played very well. Another thing I would say is that in my lifetime, I can remember us losing League Cup finals to Partick Thistle, to Rafe Rovers and to Kilmarnock. So I know Lennon's got a bad, was having a bad uh, time of it at Hamden, but, you know, Celtic traditionally being strong favourites in the League Cup final, Dundee in 73, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that it's, it, 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 there are occasions where it doesn't work out well for us, and it was just one of those days. Andrew, you'd been reporting on it, I assume? I was reporting on it. You know, my memory is, um, I was the last guy to leave, the, you know, the huge big press area at, uh, at Hamden. I was the last guy to leave because our paper wouldn't accept We'd heard that Liam Kelly's dad had died, you know, the commander right. father yep. had died in the game. And they wanted three sources. They wanted three sources. But every other newspaper ran with, well, like, uh, we'd spoke to people in the mix zone after, we'd spoke to the fellow players and all that, and it was so, 
Trad- like they, they're just like ash and face. All their players, they just won the League Cup, beat Celtic in the League Cup final, but must have been a really weird occasion for them. A really strange occasion. But I had to wait to get the hospital weren't getting back to me and all that because before my editor was willing to print the story, he wanted me to have three separate sources that Liam Kelly's father had died. So that was a strange memory I have of it. I also have um, the memory of it is like it was a certain penalty. I watched that recently. It was a definite Celtic should definitely have a penalty. Uh, it was definitely a penalty when uh, and it was Dieter van Turnout, the the guy that that, that scored the goal. Mm, yeah. it, was a, it was a great it was a was a it was a great header, wasn't it? Like a uh, great cross. Great a cross, great cross and great header. And um and Cammy Bell with that although I agree with you Stephen, it wasn't a Celtic pounding a goal but he had one of those days, he, probably the, the day of his career, Cammy Bell, the commander keeper. Yeah. But it was really weird to watch Celtic losing to mm. a team outside of Rangers and a cup. Because it, it kind of, that, that disappeared in the modern era. It really didn't harm Celtic and Rangers, the kind of, in this millennium, that they were losing finals to, to anybody but each other. So was, probably we, the first, was it, was it Stephen, that Celtic and Rangers had lost their final, first final? in the millennium to a team outside of each other. Well, that's interesting if that's the case, yes. I think I think you're probably probably right. And uh, yeah. um, so we back to back to the league because immediately because the thing about the League Cup final is we'd drawn with Aberdeen the game before the League Cup final and then the game following the League Cup final was away to Rangers um on the twenty fifth of March at Ibrooks and obviously it was the first time we played them after their their administration. So there was, uh, despite the disappointment of the League Cup, but there was great excitement about what was going to follow afterwards when we were going to go to Ibrox and they were on a downer because of everything that was happening and we were going to win. And did we did we need a point to win the league that day? I think if we'd won at Ibrox, we we'd have won the league. Uh, won the league and, yeah. and, if we won that day, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that so, was a so, disappointment. So so yeah, um, Robert, we go to Ibrox and we lose. Um, so, your memories of that? Memories is uh, watched it on the telly. So it must have been on Singapore telly. I just sat there. I presume it was a lunch time, kick off, and a reasonable kick off time for me in Asia. And I've never been so angry. You know, when we were three down, shouting, swearing, screaming at the telly. The kids are diving out the right, you know. And uh, my wife came and sat next to me and tried to calm me down. And then we scored two goals in the last couple of minutes to give me some ridiculous hope. I think Scott Brown scored a penalty and uh, Thomas Robinson scored. So we had played really badly that day and didn't deserve anything other than a defeat. I, I don't remember much of it. The game and about Rangers goals. I remember the Northern Irish guy, the young guy, uh, Andy Little. Andy Little, yeah, he scored. Mm. So yeah, pretty angry. Um, was not expecting that. Chad Uri Chad Uri get sent off after about half an hour, didn't he? Mm. Chad Uri and Victor Wanyama. We went down to nine men in that game. Oh, right, right. right. Because I, I, I remember, the thing I remember about the game is, I is, um, can't remember who the referee was, but the, the general consensus was because we couldn't be allowed to win the league with Rangers going into the ministry, we couldn't be allowed to win the league at, at Ibrox. And so the referee in performance with Chad Dere off and Victor Wanyama off had all been about. And then giving Celtic an 89th minute penalty when Rangers were 3 0 up, so it didn't really matter. <laughs> that, that was the sort of narrative that I remember coming out of the game. Um, that was a 21 game unbeaten run in the league came to an end then mm. just looking up the referee was Callum Murray and the score after 71 minutes was just one run so you know, a lot of, of activity at the end Sonny Aluko scored for Rangers that day and the winner the ultimate winner was Lee Wallace don't remember no, I can't say I do. One of these days, it happens after you've won, that when the league's effectively won, it's like, how often did Celtic used to win the dead rubbers 
against Rangers when Rangers during nine in a row year era. How often you're a cricketing man? How often did England would win the the the, the, the test against Australia once the Ashes was settled? Eh? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When it's when it's a when it's a dead. I mean, that's the thing. Well, you know, the the Hamden season for us when we beat Rangers comfortably. Yeah. The best, uh, in the, the, in the best the last example game. is two seasons ago, but when um, Rangers played Celtic at, at the at the end of the season, and um, my my son was reaching that, that Rangers won three 0 No. Celtic played that. I think that was the day that we realised that Kobayashi wasn't going to be a player. And, yeah. and, but I think O was up front rather than Kyogo and that kind of thing. And my son was raging them up. Why be upset about that game? That, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter a, a, a jot. You know, just, just let it go. Because it, it, as we've already said there, that it, it happens so often to either yep. team. That whoever wins the league is in the ascendancy. When it comes to the last game, the opposition win it. But it, does, it, it matters not a great deal. No. So, so Stephen was uh, based on the team selection. If Ange doesn't care, why should he be? Why should he bother? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I suppose what we what we didn't you know at that time it would be the last league meeting, or you could ever say like depends where you want to go here. The last <laughs> league meeting ever between Celtic and Rangers, or the last league meeting in the uh, 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 kind of four years four. Four and a bit years, you know. Well, there's one more to come, isn't there? Yeah, there's one more to come. One more to come. Was there one more to come? After the split, it's Celtic Park. Because... Yeah, so it was the last time we ever played... How did that one go? It was the last... We won 3-0. It was the the last time we played them at Ibrox. It was the last time we would ever play the the old Rangers at Ibrox. That would... uh, Yeah, you'd say that, the old Rangers. Um, So that delayed the title... We won the title, so this was the sort of the way things go around. We we should, you know, when the, when the three three game had been the, the pivotal moment where if if it's if the result had gone against Lennon, he thought he was going to lose his job. He actually secures the title with a six 0 victory at uh, at Rugby Park. That's when it becomes mathematically certain that Celtic have won the league. It's a six. So three three saves his job. Charlie Mulgrew saves yeah. his job with the, the, the equaliser. And then um, we go back to Rugby Park, secure the league. Charlie Mulgrew starts the scoring uh, in that game as well. So there's a real, um, comes full circle, fabulous the circle of life well. in that season. Yeah, I mean, they were fabulous as well. It was like, that's the way you want to win a league. As they did under Ange kind of thing. Like, sorry, as they did this season. Again at Kilmarnock, yeah. again at Rugby Park. They just, they just turned it on. They just... You know, putting on the style. It was one of those days. I remember being, God rest his soul, but we would Kevin uh, Makara because he didn't often get the chance to cover Scottish games. So he was working for the Guardian then and all that. And they said to him, just as a wee sop, say, Kevin, go up and uh, you can cover Celtic because it looks like you win the league. And he's just, he's just his wee face, you know what I mean? That's my memory of it. Just it's a great memory, just his wee face about how chuffed the bits he was. <laughs> Not just to see Celtic win the league, but win it like that. Win it with a 6 0. You know, it was like, uh, that's what Celtic, could, you know, so often, Stephen will know better than me, but so often they're good at that. When it comes to it, when you want a, you want a moment, you want a memory, you want how, how when you seal a title and all that. And so often Celtic provide that. It's not just to get over the line. They get over the line with a plum, you know. So, so Robert. Uh, I think Charlie Mulgrew scores fabulous, though. It would be part of whether he's playing left back or left midfield, but he gets the ball out on the left and then he cuts inside the defender and he swerves one in his right foot. I think Charlie Mogri was player of the year. I don't know whether it was the journalists player of the year or the players player of the year. He had a fantastic season. I think that's he was definitely he was definitely the journalist player of the year, I remember, because um he gave a great acceptance speech. Because do you remember <laughs> that Michelle Moan do you remember Michelle Moan had had had, had, had kind of had mm. him into uh, the police about his kid was in the car That's and right. he was yeah. in the he was in the supermarket. So he, he stood up at his acceptance speech with the, the football writers Dana and he looked at his watch and says, I, I, you know I can't speak for long because the Wayne's in the motor. Look, like, uh, you know <laughs> that, was just, that was his opening line. He's a funny guy, Charlie. He's a funny guy. He's a great guy. Like. Uh, 
but he was he was blinding. He was blinding that season. Like uh, he really he took on a new level because I was never very sure of him. But he really found something else that that season. He did improve. He was a guy who just kept getting better as the older he, the older he became. I, th- I think as he got old, he was one of these people that as he got older, he understood his own limitations, and also understood um, what managers needed from him. Um, you know, when for a defender, he'd suddenly fit them. Oh yeah, he's a really skillful player for for a defender. Yeah, 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 real. Yeah, he'd real, he'd real genuine eye. The, the the wand of a left foot, as they always say. Why is it always just the left foot? It's the wand. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so so that so that's as uh, secured the title six 0 Rugby Park. Only one more game of any import to go in the league campaign, and that is Rangers come as we just touched on. Rangers come to Celtic Park for the final ever uh, Celtic Rangers game, the final ever Old Firm game. Yeah, it's a way you could put it actually. There's a way that, that, that straddles the fence for you, Andrew. It's the final old firm game. Uh, was it Celtic Park 3 0s? So, Stephen, do you remember much of that game? I do actually. That was a really enjoyable day. I mean, the one thing that sticks in my mind, is, and, and we'll, we all know what it is, was the banner. The, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Oh, yeah. Which really summed up the whole situation um, in terms of the. <laughs> The Rangers support that day was just desperate. I mean, you, 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 you never get a song out of them. They were totally yeah. um, subdued. Uh, Celtic played very well on the day, played really well. But what um, sticks in my mind is that the, the Celtic Park DJ at the end. And, uh, oh, what was the song? It was it Three Degrees? Um, when will I see you again? When will we see you again? Oh, yeah. right? And that was just so funny. That, that yeah. everybody just burst out laughing when that was played it, and they played it really loud. Yeah. But, but when will we see you again? Because uh, it, to be honest, we didn't know when we were going to see them again. As it turned out, it would be four years. Um, then when the next team Fibrox came to light, but uh, yeah, very enjoyable day. Just summed up the season, and it just showed the the um, the the gap between Celtic and Rangers at that time. We had so many players that were playing with their skin. Guys like Joe Ledley had, had come on a really good game. Wanyama had, had mm-hmm. cemented his place. Uh, Chris Commons was having a great time here. Hooper and Stokes up front, fantastic. And you, you looked at the Rangers team and, you know, they, somebody mentioned a Luco earlier. He, he, was a, he was a very poor player, I thought. And the, the other guys as well, like Bartley and uh, Goya oh, and yeah. Big Carter, a uh, Romanian guy. That, that, so they, they, they were scraping the barrel at that point. Was that the day... Was that the day that the banner went all the way round the ground and even got passed along through the director's box, or was that a different day? Well, I think that was a were... different day. That was a different day, because this was, a, as, as Stephen says, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I think that's possibly the Green Brigade's best. I yeah, don't think yeah. uh, they've surpassed yeah. that. It was phenomenal. You know, it You're was right. phenomenal. Who were the four? Who it was it. Hector it was, the was tax one. Man. Hector was one. Uh, White Lennon, was, Lennon was two. Uh, White was one, wasn't he? Craig White. Craig White. Craig White. Yeah. So who was the fourth one then? Oh bloody hell! Was it... I'm trying to. I'm just pulling it up to have a look at it right now. Um, was it Murray? It must have been Murray, no? It was. No, one was I, just I, death. There was. One was just yeah. death. One was right. White, one was Hector, one was Lennon, and one, and one was just the Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper. Right, right, right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could have been Murray, since he was should one have of been the... Murray. I mean, it should, it should have been Murray. Murray. Cause I don't was... know how many articles I wrote about that, but try to blame the wrong guy. Yeah, he, he was he was the he was the real reason they went bust was David Murray. Yeah. You know, should have been stripped of his, of his knighthood. He was, what, 10%? Ten percent of the of the entire debt of the Bank of Scotland that went bust was mm. David Murray, mm-hmm. uh, and then they swapped. Because you said earlier three hundred million quid, it was close to a billion, and they swapped debt for equity in all these businesses, which was basically just writing off the debt until yeah, they yeah, got yeah. to about three hundred million, and then they pulled the plug. So they were pulling the plug at three hundred million, and it didn't sound quite as bad as pulling the plug. At, at, at close to a billion pounds, it was nine hundred and something million pounds. Yeah, that was um, his debt mountain. Debt Mountain, that was the phrase I used to use. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, 
Robert, your your memories of of that three 0 victory and end of that season. Well, I remember I said Charlie Morgan was brilliant that header for the first goal. Actually, all the goals were tremendous that day because the second one was uh, Chris Commons made a run from the halfway line. Somebody squared it to him, and the keeper's coming out, and he just dinks it. Oh, boy. Beautiful finish. And the third one, Hooper. I thought Gary Hooper was a tremendous striker when he. He was. He, he, I don't think he's he's recognised as, as, as he should be. Mm. He really yeah. was like a, a top notch striker. I've seen it the season against Hearts. The first goal is five. And, yeah. And I think. I think he was a brilliant, brilliant striker. I was really sorry that he left a club. I would have done better than Norwich City, I think. But, uh, mm. yeah. You know, he was very consistent for us. I think he did three or four seasons, four seasons maybe, with us, and he was very consistent. He scored 20 goals a season. So. So, yeah, no, they, we finished a, a good win over Hearts. Um, and that was that was the end of the season because there was there was no Scottish Cup final to, to look forward. Yeah, so that's that was it. As you say, we we finished the season with five 0 over Hearts when it was five Gary Hooper goals over Hearts. It was a tremendous way uh, final day of the season. Um and the one, the only uh, competition not not mentioned is obviously the Scottish Cup, which normally finishes at the end of the league season. We beat Peter Head away three uh, 0 um, and you know another trip up north. We we beat Inverness two 0 um, We 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 were away at Dundee United and beat them four 0 That again then starts the conspiracy theories about we're always getting drawn away from home <laughs> in cup games, and then uh, again. Continuing the building the momentum of the idea that Lennon can't win at Hamden uh, principle, we lose 2-1, two, two hearts, uh, last minute, Craig Beatty. Um, it was one of these really dubious handball, if it, from memory, was it handball against Joe Ledley, where the ball was basically battered against his hand from like two feet away or something like that, and, and, and uh, Beatty scores the, the penalty. That's that's my sort of recollection of it. Saint Stephen, you remember anything about it? Just remember Beatty's celebration, to be honest, which was quite over the top. I mean, obviously he's delighted to score, and and I can accept it. He's decided to, uh, delighted to score against his old club to put one over on them. But running behind the track side, and you know, it just a wee bit overkill in that respect. He ripped his, remember he ripped his shirt off and instead of having mm. a six pack it's this kind of like a typical west of Scotland kind of you know what I mean? kind, of, uh, kind of generous girth there you know like <laughs> a, and he, he really had one of those kind of it was like a, a medallion man's kind of hairy chest remember it was like a god I, I took my I took my uh, I take it's one of my younger family or whatever I decided to go as a punter that day because again it was a Sunday so I'd been to the uh, I think I'd been at the Hibs one the, the, the day before. Like um and it was we were right beside the Hearts fans and they were so foul. It was such a foul afternoon in all sorts of all sorts of ways. Such a foul crowd. We had to walk through them and all that. That's my memory of that. Just how can I uh Were they in financial difficulty at that time? Had they come out of it? I can't, I can't quite remember the time of the year. Issues. I think, I think theirs came a wee bit later. I think it was 2014 <laughs> that they ran into right. issues. But Robert, you got any memories of of, the, of that? Yeah. I mean, obviously Hearts then went on to thump Hibs in the final. Yeah. Um, I just remember that in the... I don't remember that much about the game. But I remember our equaliser. I hope it was pretty late on. So I remember leaping about, celebrating, thinking, OK, this is going to go the extra time. Yeah. And, you know, I think we'd played okay that day and, you know, we just missed a lot of chances. Hearts were decent. They, they had the the other goal scorer for them that day was Rudy Scatchel, who was, he was a good player. Yeah. He was a good player, yeah. Yeah. They had the Zalukist or something, the big Lithuanian guy. Oh, yeah. He was a decent player away. as well. He passed yeah, he away. Did pass away, very didn't young, he? didn't he? He did. Sad. Because that was still around the time 
Lord Hart's just fading away from the, from having the money about the club at that at that time, and yeah. then you know, obviously the, the, the financial difficulties were about to were Still about to go. So with the contracts, did he? Can I kind of yeah yeah yeah, but it was the legacy of Romanov, Vladimir Romanov. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we finished the season. Um, we finished the season with just the league. We didn't we we didn't win any of the cups. Uh, football in general. Uh, Chelsea beat Bayern in uh, in Munich. Uh, to win the the Champions League, I think was that not the famous John Terry puts the strip on to oh, at, the, yeah. at the end of the game, uh, and Atletico Madrid beat Atletico Bilbao three 0 in, in Romania for the Europa League. Our, I was just looking at who played the most games. Fraser Foster played forty seven. Adam Matthews thirty seven. Is it Gary did manage to make fourteen appearances. Mastorovic twenty five. Kelvin Wilson twenty two. Scott Brown thirty two. Samanas thirty eight. Stokes forty seven. Chadery twenty three. Joe Ledley, 46. Chris Commons, 33. Um, Kyle, 28. Um, Thomas Ronya, that we mentioned, 17. Um, Gary Hooper had the most appearances with 50 appearances. Victor Wanyama, 42. James Forrest, 43. Uh, there's a, I mean, you can see from that, Charlie McGrew, 44. There was, a, there was a core group of players who played virtually all the, all the games. That's what you're seeing from, from, from that. Think- um, I think Harry, interestingly, Chris Commons only scored one that season. It was the goal against Rangers of Park Head. Mm. So I'm trying to remember why he was, you know, he was Chris usually... Chris Commons, was a Chris Commons got a bad injury, Robert. I think it was at Hearts at Tynecastle when they lost 2-0 and he got get carried off that day. No, a big recollection. Yeah. He got sent off in that game uh, uh, back in October. I think Harry said he played 33 games, but yeah, just uh-huh. one. Um, I'm just trying, That's to, I'm trying to find. Yeah, 33 games. That's um, but yeah, one, one, one goal. <clears throat> um, so, so yeah, Cooper it was just quite... fell short of the 30 goals as well. 29 goals he scored that season. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So, and and obviously, as we're coming to the end of the season, then, uh, and we'll probably talk about this more in the in the next episode because it was the. Uh, the next episode was was whether there was going to be a Rangers at all uh, at the start mm. of the next season and how they were going to be dealt with. But as we were coming to the end of that April uh, period of time, that's when there was then lots of talk about uh, Rangers and the, and up for sale. I mean, I I can remember a guy coming into my office, property guy with paperwork that thick, puts it down on my desk and says, "That's all the property that Rangers own," and and that and it was basically he was interested in doing a property deal. On, on Rangers and uh, I had the good fortune I was dealing with two people who were offering to buy Rangers at double the price that they ended up selling for oh. uh, both of them was that £4 um, then because I think Charles Green gave uh, Craig White £2 didn't he so <laughs> well, was your pal offering um, to buy it for 4 quid? well this was off the off the administrators that uh, ended up Charles Green paid £5 million quid, and, and the two people I knew, knew were both in deals that were £10 million quid. one of them one of them, yeah, I think we're far enough away now that I can talk about this. So one of them was what he was looking to do was uh, Western Scotland Rugby Club. Oh, yeah. um, uh, he could get he could get housing on there. Uh, I think. Oh no, he could get housing on Rangers Training Ground at Auchin. Whatever it was, he was trying to do. I'm trying to remember what it was, but he was trying to do a, a land swap with Western oh. Scotland Rugby Club and Rangers Training Ground. That's what it was. He could get planning on Rangers Ground, on, on, on uh, Western Scotland Rugby Club. and he, but So what he was trying to do was buy Rangers. He would then do a swap where Western Scotland Rugby Club would play at Rangers Training Ground and he would then build housing. So basically the deal was roughly, the numbers were roughly this, buy Rangers for 9 million quid, that's what it was. Buy Rangers for 9 million quid. He wasn't a Rangers fan, this guy. Buy Rangers for 9 million and the deal, he had an agreement in principle with Stuart Milne and a couple of others, I think Taylor Wimpy, to buy the land, he had an agreement in principle to buy the land at West of Scotland Rugby Club and they would put housing on it and they would buy it off him for 11 million quid. So his proposal was buy Rangers for nine, uh, do the land swap, uh, West of Scotland Rugby Club would play at Auchenhowie, uh, or whatever its name was at the time. He uh, he would then sell West of Scotland Rugby Club to West of Scotland, to Stuart Milne and Taylor Wimpy and a consortium of builders for eleven million quid, and by this point, 
Rangers fans might have started to work out that he wasn't a Rangers fan and might even have found the backdated history of his only of his only involvement of liking any football in any media was Celtic. So he was a bit worried at how quickly he found out. So he needed to do the deal really quickly. And then what he would do, he would hand Rangers over to the Rangers Supporters Trust for free. And he would walk away with two million quid from the deal. That was his deal. Right. And didn't ham. And then the other one was a consortium. Um, and they were, it was a consortium headed up by a guy called Frank Blinn. A very. Oh, Frank. Yeah, you know, you'll know Frank Robert. So, so the consortium was Frank Blinn. And there was a whole load of issues about, they were looking at the possibility of, because they were having such a struggle over the deal, they were looking at the possibility of Rangers playing at Hamden and leaving the administrators with Ibrox to, to chip down the price of Ibrox because Ibrox then has no value if there's no Rangers playing at it because the housing, the the, the value of the housing you could put on Ibrox was pretty low, uh, you know, in, in Ibrox govern area, not, not demeaning it, just the practicalities of it. And then the cost of demolishing Ibrox to put the housing on it, it wasn't a... It wasn't a, a, a proposition and, you know, you, okay, maybe you can put some supermarkets or stuff like that on it, but there was already an Asda, just big Asda just down the road and yeah, there was a yeah, retail yeah. thing there. So there was no massive value on that and their idea was that they were going to go and play at Hamden for a period of time. Mm. And they had Richard Goff as part of their group and I remember I was sitting, I, could, I, could, I couldn't remember the name of the restaurant, but I could drive you to the restaurant in Edinburgh where I was sitting having lunch with Frank Blinn and his phone starts going, and he looks at it, and he looks at it, and then he turns to me and he says, I need to go. What is it? We're being shafted over the Rangers deal. And he got up and left. Mm. And uh, and then Charles Green picked And his deal was 10 million quid as well. And Charles Green so picked Frank, it up for five. Frank Blinn was one hour away from becoming the administrator of Celtic in 1994. He was the prime scholar of this country. He was not there was also a bid for Singapore, Rangers, and a lot of the guys that were for Chinese money, but trimmed it up by a couple of um, expatriate um, Rangers fans in Asia, and they were looking at 15. They walked away because they could not get access documents they requested and I think the same thing happened with Miller, the American Oh, yeah, Bill Miller and his incubator proposal the history but the thing and all is, that see, the, see his incubator proposal <laughs> it's effectively what ended up happening with Rangers which is, I'm going to create this other entity and then we'll just transfer all the trophies and the history will go into this other entity. And at the time it was scoffed at as that's ludicrous and the Rangers fans chased them away because the whole concept was they wanted continuity. And they've ended up accepting the principle of what his deal was. Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose because that's what that's what happens at football clubs. It's like, as I say, like um, I don't like Rangers exceptionalism and I think we all agree with... No exceptionalism for Rangers, so Rangers don't treat Rangers differently. So I treat Rangers the same way I treat Luton Town, the same way I treat Coventry City, the same way I treat Middlesbrough, who are all been liquidated. Like uh, you know, you look at Middlesbrough, uh, you look at Middlesbrough's fan, uh, sorry, website in the history of the club. There's a there's a paragraph and it says Middlesbrough were liquidated, but the club was saved. That's how it goes. That's how it runs. I phoned up Luton Town when it was all this was happening with Rangers. I said. Do you still you get any pictures up of David Pleat running around the stadium and all that? Because you're a different club. And the guy said, "What are you talking about?" Because they were liquidated in the year two thousand, a year mm. after Rangers were liquidated, Coventry City were liquidated. <laughs> like they just carried on ten points and you carry on. Because that's why that's why people talk about Doncaster trying to go easy in Rangers. He came from an English perspective, and they're no squeamish about it. They just see it as a brand. They just see it as a brand, and as long as somebody wants to carry on the brand, I mean, if you remember when they got the when the when the CVA was turned down, uh, HMRC released a statement and said our decision today does not preclude Rangers continuing as a going concern. That was their line in the statement. The interesting, the always the interesting thing for me was the fact that you know Charles Green paid Duffin Phelps five and a half million pounds to. By the assets of Rangers, 
and within six months they'd done a listing on the stock exchange and, and raised 20 million or something, tw low 20 millions for, for the same asset. And I know, I don't, under, I never understand that kind of thing. You know, but my own, the only conclusion that you can draw from that is that Duffin felt they were doing a very good job in trying to, you know, get the best deal possible for the creditors. Yeah, so, surely they could have done you know, better than Charles Green. Yeah, He's I know, like that but, professional but, northerner in the, the Harry Enfield show. You know, I like what I say and I say what I like. You know, that's it. <laughs> See the way he went on? It was crazy. I'm like Nanny McPhee. When you when you don't like me but you need me, I'll be here. But when you need when you like me but you don't need me, I'm gone. That's what he told us one time and all this, you know. I, and I so said, oh, like Celtic, how can you ever? Celtic have just made 17 million. Like, 17 million is nothing. It's nothing. I'll make double that. Like he was, I said, all right, but nobody's ever made double that in Scottish football. <laughs> well. The other thing about Charles Green that sticks in my mind is that somebody, my acquaintance, um, said that he uh, he only ever had the one suit. You know, <laughs> he was clearly a guy of limited means. Every time he turned up at a meeting, he had the same suit on. <laughs> he probably borrowed it off of Duff and Phelps, you know what I mean? Just cleared some of the crumbs away. Yeah, and then I, I, I then started to, I then started to be doing more stuff down in London and came, you know, interacting with people who knew people like Imran Ahmed and stuff like that. And yeah, um, yeah. He, he, he has a Trump, a kind of Trump type character. You know, this just complete bullshit. You just say it often enough that you think mm. people will believe it. Just bulldoze your way with, with kind of brainless words. That's what, that's what you know. That's that's what we're seeing. Like uh, with Trump as well, just utter bullshitters. You know, grifters. We see it. You know, we're the grifters have so taken we, over. I think it was. I think it was just after the season finished that the 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 whole thing about the the, the, the not was it was it in, was it in the May just after the season finished that 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 famous creditors meeting that lasted one minute or whatever it was was that mm. in the May twenty twelve when. It was all finalised. No, that June, I think it was, was June, it June, wasn't it? June, June I. yeah. That was when the CBA got rejected by yeah. HMRC. Yeah, one hundred and forty year uh, history over in one minute or something like the Daily Record had or something. Yeah, yeah. so the, the so. HMRC have more than fifty percent of the the debt was owed to them, so they they have the ability to. One hundred thirty-four million pounds was the total amount of Rangers debt to. At the end point, so, um, but anyway, that that's us. Um, we will. Uh, that's that's the first season of the of the ten in a row uh, of the yeah. nine in a row. Uh, we, we'll get to why the ten didn't happen. When we get to as the first season of the nine in a row, and the next episode we will no doubt start with the debate about whether there is a Rangers and where that Rangers play and the fact that there was two Rangers existed at the same time uh, for a brief window as they went and played Brecon and then what we did, uh, more importantly, uh, as a club going forward for the next um, eight seasons. So with that, I will say, Andrew, Robert, Stephen, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thanks. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Bye, nice bye. Right, bye. In your smile. Thank you for listening to this podcast from Celtic Underground, the world's longest running football fans podcast. That was episode one of the second nine in a row Chronicles. Now, if you are not currently a subscriber to the CelticUnderground.substack.com and for goodness sake, why not? And you're missing out on Selic Da, you're missing out on loads of stuff with Andrew H. Smith, his In Conversation podcasts, you're missing out on just loads of, loads of brilliant content. Anyway, if you go to theceliticunderground.substack.com forward slash 5016E026, I know, catchy title, that's theceliticunderground.substack.com forward slash 5061 E026. If you are not a subscriber, you can subscribe for 30 days for free. So you can get the first four seasons of the Nine Year Old Chronicles along with everything else to decide whether it's brilliant value for money to then get the full subscription. 
Anyway, enough of me. That was me, Harry Beatty, with all the guys, and we'll be back next Sunday as well, every Sunday, with the Nine Row Chronicles. And it is Let your arms be as warm As the sun from up above Bring me fun, bring me sunshine Bring me love, sweet love Bring me fun, bring me sunshine Bring me love